Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the Board of Supervisors meeting for Tuesday, September 15th. We begin this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Supervisor Wygan. If you would please stand. Thank you. We will now have our statement of meeting procedures read by our clerk. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, September 15th, 2015. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There is a three minute time limit per speaker. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There is a three minute time limit per speaker, which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the board. Keep in mind that the chairman has a discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that all cell phones be turned off or put in silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our consent calendar we do have one item that was added to consent it was posted timely on Friday and this is a, a sheriff item so supplemental agenda has been distributed to board members and is available for the public to review as well any board members have any items they would like off of consent for discussion at this time yes mr. chair I'd like to uh, pull 12 B boy for discussion all right item 12 B Bravo if you don't mind uh, will be removed for discussion. Any other supervisors have any other items? Okay, any members of the public have any item that they would like have removed from consent for discussion? Seeing none, do we have a motion on the remainder of consent? Second. A motion, Duran, second, Montgomery. Roll call, please. Duran? Yes. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Montgomery? Yes. Euler? Aye. Thank you. All right, we'll get to that item after we do public comment and supervisor committee report. So at this time, uh, we are going to open up for public comment on any item that is not on the agenda. Understanding the board cannot take action on items raised under public comment. As you step forward, please identify yourself for us so we get your name on the record and uh, try to keep your comments to, uh, to the three minutes. That'll be lit up right there for you shortly. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you. My name is Chris Reams. I'm uh, on the board of directors for the Forest Hill Fire Prevention District, as most of you already know. <laughs> I have a little thing to talk about here. We're having a dilemma. Our, our problem is that we're providing emergency services with our ambulance and engine outside of our fire district without being reimbursed for, our, for that provision. When we go outside our district, our district is unprotected for fires and medical aids. It's unfair to the district taxpayers to be left unprotected. See the map there? I gave you guys a nice little map. Thank you for the county, by the way. You guys printed that for our meeting last night, and we appreciate that because it's perfect. As you can see, that we have that little sp that space there. It's called Forest Hill, and you'll notice there's this giant green area there that is actually the, the area that we're talking about. Okay, so it's not a little, it's not two miles. It's about 300 miles, okay? All right. It is with a heavy heart, by the way, that we're move forward, moving forward with this ch change because it's painful to do it, because we are service-minded people, and that's how we think. The facts are that we have two, two people at each station. One's an engineer and one's a paramedic. We have two stations, and we only have four people staffed because of budget cuts. That's how it is, and that's what we're living with right now, okay? Um, so... The other, continuing, the, in addition to the, the engine provides jaws of lives, airbags, rope rescue equipment, and all kinds of other supplies to, to go up country because mo a lot of motorcycles go off the cliff or cars go off the cliff and we had a head-on crash within, what, two days 
you know, up there. We had to take people out with jaws of life. It takes equipment. It takes training. There's a lot to it, not just a, a basic engine, okay? Uh, Cal Fire in the station up there does not have this equipment, by the way, or the training. Um, uh, calls commonly take four to ten hours. We have some that lasted almost 20 hours. For example, we had to pack somebody out in a Stokes litter out of, out of Mumford Bar, if you know where that is, and come up out of the canyon. It's, a, it's four or five miles, and it's very hard. It took them about seven or eight hours to do that, and then we put them on a helicopter, okay, because the helicopter couldn't get to where they were. So it's, 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 we, we provide lots of services, and during that 20 hours or 26 hours or four hours, there's nobody in our district at all, okay? The board feels that we cannot abandon our district to serve the county at this time. If someone has a critical problem like a heart attack or the house catches on fire, there will be no one to respond, at least in a timely manner. You know, that's a nightmare by itself, isn't it? I mean, I would think it is. Um, Forest Hill taxpayers pay for us to serve them, not the county, outside the county, okay, outside the district. But we have a solution. I don't come here with, a, with, a, with just complaining. I have a solution. We have broken down the finances so we know that the total cost for four people that we send up there to have it on duty and is $307,000. Is that my time? Go ahead. We have already said that we pay for about half, the, we already said that we'll pay for half the labor cost of the ambulance, okay? That's $157,000 of the total cost of 307. dollars We're gonna pay that right up top. So we're in if we get some help, okay? The county finance director, as we have, you know, has, which you all know, has come to us and said, well, we have $500,000 or so in your reserve. So, and, and we were all excited about that, but when we broke it down, we found out some interesting things. If you look at this sheet, you'll look at it on the front sheet there. It shows um, our expense sheet and our expenses, our SCBAs, testing, beer bottles, hose, turnouts, on and on and on, $270,000. Now, some of that may be gotten, may be paid for by grants and we'll go to look at Bay Area people that are selling hose or whatever we have to do to save money. But the problem is, is that, um, we, don't, we can't take the money out of reserves until we solve those problems. So in the next page, you'll look at a simple cost breakdown. You take $500,000, you have mitigation fees, capital expenditures only. Now that means that you can't pay for wages and equipment, you know all that, right? That's $140,000. Equipment costs not budgeted, we talked about in the front page, $270,000. Now like I said, some of it may be paid for by the grant. Our 20-year-old engines have to replace soon. They're already past their due date to, to be replaced. But we're, you know, $35,000 a year to repair them is what it's costing us, okay? It, even if we finance them, as the, the um, finance director um, stated, that, you know, it's still going to be a huge amount of payments. You know, if we have an El Nino year next year, we take 117000 or more out of our budget because we're sort of surviving on strike team money. Um, a 25% reserve is set, um, is considered appropriate. That's about $312,000 of our budget. And some of that number is to, right now, is to pay bills. We took 150 draw yesterday out of that money um, to pay the bills. And those are everyday operations. You know, you all can do the numbers. It doesn't take very smart. It doesn't go very far, does it? Can we really afford to spend our district tax money outside of our district is the question we look at. All right. Okay. If we continue to pay for the labor costs for one whole year, it's a $269, and that we pretty much spend our reserve, we do that. So we just really can't spend all of our reserve on it, but we're still willing to spend part of it, okay? A county representative said we should borrow the money. Well, do we really want to borrow money to, to serve the county? Maybe I don't, don't think that's a good taxpayer idea. Another county representative said we have, since we have reserve, we should pay for the whole thing. Uh, remember, we are already paying for half the cost as it is. It's difficult to understand why we should be required to spend our taxpayers' reserve money outside of our district. To me, it's ludicrous, but I, I just don't understand the concept. Does the county really expect us to spend our district taxpayer money to serve the county outside our district when we are barely are making it financially? We, we, we're making it, we are, and we got reserve now. We're really excited about that, but it's not a sustaining level. However, we offer a solution. In spirit of cooperation with all of this stuff, because we really want to serve the district, we would negotiate with you the balance of the cost for staffing to run up country because we know if we add two more people, we can add, we'll, we can sneak by. That's all we have to do is add two people, $157,000, and we'll be, we'll be 
seriously looking forward to trying to work with you to solve that problem. Please consider our offer as we want desperately to solve this problem. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate your time this morning. Anybody else under public comment this morning? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, take up supervisor committee reports. Any supervisors have anything they want to report out this morning? Nope. Okay. Then let's move to the consent item 12B that was removed for our discussion. And this is a CEDRA item. So I'm assuming Michael, somebody. <laughs> looking for a little help here. Um, so Safer Mill, phase two, C, final map. Yes, good morning. Except the improvements is complete, authorized, so perhaps we start with Supervisor Montgomery. You have a question on this item? Yeah, or? thank you. I, d okay. I don't have a particular concern with this item per se, but I just want to make sure that in light of this, some of the conversation we had around the retreat and the fact that we accepted their final map only to discover later that not all the things that they were supposed to have installed, like a gate just past their roundabout, um, were installed. I want to make sure that we're actually going on site, going down the checklist and verifying that all the improvements um, that were intended to be installed implemented actually are being installed and implemented. Uh, yes, uh, Leslie Amesbury, Engineering and Surveying. Um, yes, our inspectors up in Tahoe have, have done the inspection for the acceptance of improvements. Um, all of the improvements are shown on the improvement plans for this unit, um, most of which were actually installed with, with Unit 2B. Um, I think um, there was some uh, additional water and sewer improvements and a small amount of paving. Um, with the final map, we do go through the conditions of approval, uh, making sure that all the conditions have been met for this unit. Uh, we get sign-offs from the different departments, but as far as acceptance of the improvements, um, our inspectors are, are comparing, um, doing on-site inspections and comparing them to the improvement plans that were approved for that unit. So an inspector actually goes out physically on site to verify yes. that all these improvements have yes. been installed. I'm delighted to hear that because it was a little bit of an issue with the retreats. And I just want to make sure that we don't um, replicate uh, problems that we've had in the past and that we really do learn from our mistakes and continue to move forward and provide better service. So with that, um, uh, with that affirmation, I move that we approve this item. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Second. Okay, uh, we have a motion Montgomery and a second by Wygant to approve item 12B. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you so much. All right, we will uh, move on to our first department head item. That is administrative services, a procurement item. Speaking of uh, fire and fire-related services. Yeah. Board of Supervisors, uh, Chairman Euler, good morning. My name is John McEldowney with the Placer County Office of Emergency Service. Emergency Services with me today is April Pay, senior buyer for uh, Placer County Procurement. Uh, before I get uh, this one going, I'd like to uh, queue up a short video that talks about uh, fire services within Placer County. Okay. And hopefully that's just going to magically happen. <laughs> it's amazing how that happens. Yep. Things that confuse the living daylights out of people. Rubik's Cube, product assembly instructions on Christmas morning, and Placer County Fire Service. Yes, the system of providing fire service in Placer isn't known for its simplicity. You'd think it would be as easy as, there's a fire! We are here to help! But over decades and generations, instead we have this. This map shows the 19 different fire districts in Placer, each responsible for its own local independent fire service. Each has its own chief, captains, lieutenants, firefighters, emergency medical staff, administrative support, lawyers, unions, fire boards, and more. Only one of them, this one right here, is actually run by the government of Placer County, and that's through a contract with Cal Fire. So here are the 19 different fire districts, each with its own local taxes and fees above and beyond property taxes. But it gets more complicated than that because within Placer County's fire district, there are seven different areas, 
each with its own fees and taxes for fire service. Over the years, voters in each area have determined how much they're willing to pay to fund fire service in their area, and as a result, how robust that fire service should be. So in all, you've got 26 different zones, all paying different fees, receiving different levels of fire service. For example, Dry Creek is one specific area within the Placer County Fire District. It covers this much territory. And most residents there pay $199 per year for fire protection service above and beyond their property taxes. Forest Hill, meanwhile, covers this much territory, and residents there pay $121 per year. Adding fuel to the fire, pun intended, many Placer County residents pay an annual State Responsibility Area Fire Prevention Fee, the so-called fire tax of either $117 or $152 per year, not one penny of which goes to any of our Placer County firefighting organizations. The SRA tax is state funding for CAL FIRE prevention efforts, and that confuses people even more. Luckily, when the going gets tough, we all work together to support each other. But no matter how you slice it, it's an outdated system that began early in the last century, and we need to bring it into modern times. It's no wonder many of the fire districts, including Placer County Fire, are in financial trouble. We aren't alone in this, though. Counties throughout California are facing the same challenge. Our fire service is in need of a quadruple bypass, a major overhaul. Some have suggested that the county should provide financial support to these struggling districts, but that's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. And how is it fair to the people of other districts who already paid their fair share for fire service in their cities and communities? So Placer County and our fire partners are embarking on a search for a long-term solution. We are hiring an outside consultant to take a critical look at our current system and make some unbiased recommendations about the best way to organize moving forward. All options are on the table. This could result in a recommendation to consolidate all of these fire districts into one big fire service, or perhaps a couple of different districts, or perhaps something else entirely. Whatever the recommendation is, it will take all of us working together to make it successful before the whole system goes up in smoke. Thank you for your report. All right. Yeah, to confuse the living daylights. Any questions? <laughs> Rubik's Cube. I, 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 I feel a little schoolhouse rockish right there. <laughs> Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Kind of a thing. That's great. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back right after this commercial. <laughs> good morning. Yeah. So. Well, good morning. I'd like to uh, piggyback from the video, obviously, and go ahead and, uh, in terms of action, request it on this board item. Requesting that uh, your board approve the award of RFP number 10467 to CityGate Associates uh, Limited Liability Corporation out of Folsom, California, uh, to perform the fire service study in an amount not to exceed $75,000. Uh, this will be funded by the Office of Emergency Services fiscal year 2015-16 uh, proposed budget. In terms of a little bit more background uh, beyond the outstanding video that everybody just had an opportunity to watch, uh, OES provides emergency management services countywide. We do this in cooperation with local cities, special districts, fire and law enforcement agencies across the county. In terms of fire service in the county, as, as the video showed, there's 19 separate fire districts throughout the county. Each, is, each district is managed, run, administered by its own governing body. Uh, and as you've seen today, several, at least one and several other fire districts on the western slope of the county have a growing concern about their ability to provide adequate fire service for the citizens that they serve. And it's primarily due to fiscal shortages, uh, perhaps not right now, but into the future as well. We're look, they're looking long term. OES was tasked with identifying a, consult, a qualified consultant to conduct a comprehensive fire service study on the western region of the county. And more importantly, to make one or more recommendations for improving service delivery across the western slope. And as the video talked about, these recommendations run the gamut from uh, consolidating one or more agencies, improving service methods, or really any organizational structure that will best fit the fire and emergency service needs of our citizens and our residents in the region. Working with uh, procurement, county OES and uh, procurement, also with input from independent fire districts on the western side of the county, we developed a request for proposals for the purpose of identified, identifying a qualified firm for this project. Notices announcing uh, uh, the availability of RFP 
10467 were sent to about 96 potential uh, proposers via procurement's online bid system. Uh, that's called public purchase, by the way. By the RFP deadline, a total of five responses were received, a uh, panel consisting of myself, other cons uh, county executive office personnel, and area fire districts reviewed the proposals and interviewed the top two firms. And just by the way, I'd like to thank uh, the members of the panel, Chief, Law Chief Lawrence Betancourt of the South Placer Fire Protection District, Chief John Ruffcorn, the City of Auburn Public Safety Chief, Mr. George Owls, our County Fire Mitigation Coordinator, and Mr. James Importante, one of our County Management Analysts for their diligent work as selection panel members. As a result, the panel identified CityGate Associates LLC as the most qualified firm for this project. Now just to really, real quick summarize the problem. Generally speaking, fire service across the western slope is getting more expensive and, and challenging to fund, to fund just as the number and intensity and severity of wildland fires is increase, increasing. Everybody, I think, is pretty much aware of that after everything that's gone on this weekend, and fortunately in other counties very close to Placer County. And also this problem is imp impacting counties across the entire state. So what's the solution? By funding this fire service study, we shall develop a plan to address these challenges and more importantly, provide a viable and practical path to fix these problems for the foreseeable future. If approved, this funding and subsequent study will give us the opportunity, time, space, and ability to evaluate in depth fire service on the Western Slope and a process to develop solutions. CityGate is a widely respected firm in this field and holds both broad and specific expertise in assisting California counties as they grapple with increasing costs, finite budgets, and a host of other issues within fire service delivery. There's no doubt that there's going to be challenges throughout this process. I'm confident that through a collaborative and cooperative process with all the fire districts on the Western Slope, we can and we will develop implementable solutions. In terms of fiscal impact, again, this uh, is being funded by the Office of Emergency Services in our 15-16 uh, proposed budget with no net county uh, costs. Pending any questions you may have, I request that your board approve the award of RFP number 10467 to CityGate Associates out of Folsom, California to perform a fire services study in a not to exceed amount of $75,000. Okay, board members have questions. Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, is there any time frame on them when their study will be complete? Is there? Yes, they've submitted, uh, and all the firms submitted a schedule. Their time frame is approximately six months. I'm uh, severely hoping and uh, earnestly hoping that they meet that deadline. Okay. There's a tremendous amount of data to collect. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the benefits or the, the windows of opportunity that I think we have here is we're hoping and expecting that the local agency formation commission, uh, they're in the process, hopefully the final uh, stages of completing a municipal services review on fire. So a lot of the data should be relatively fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that it's not a year old because the, the MSR, the municipal services review on fire has been a long ongoing process. Right but it's better than having it, you know, five years old or 10 years old. Yeah, that was the time to do it. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we're moving forward with this, but particularly on the county side. Uh, but we do all have to work together to make this happen. All the districts have to work together to make this happen. It's a challenge, but I look forward to uh, proceeding and uh, hopefully we can come out to a sustainable solution for all the districts in Placer County. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. Okay. okay. We we have a motion, a second under discussion. However, I want to uh, afford opportunity for uh, other supervisors to make comments. Supervisor Montgomery? Yeah, I'm delighted that this is moving forward, and, and thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I do agree with some of the ex concerns expressed with fire districts about long-term sustainability. Um, w while I think that the immediate future is fairly secure for the independent special districts, there are real concerns um, within those districts and within our own district, frankly, Placer County Fire, about ongoing sustainability. And so I think this is um, really overdue. I'm delighted, frankly, that to a certain extent this was spurred 
by some of the special districts that came to us and said, we really need to talk about this, um, which is frankly a change from the past where the independent districts have said, we're good, run in our own district, thanks, Placer County, go do your own thing. I do want to clarify that at the end of this investigative process and when recommendations come forward, any special districts can say, thanks, we don't like your recommendation, we're going to go our own way and continue to do our own thing. So I just want people to be very clear, we're not going to come in with the big hammer and say, thou shalt do whatever the ultimate decision is, that it, it will be a fully participatory process. Um, and that at, if at the end of that process people don't want to participate, they don't have to. So, but I, I want to say thank you very much because I think I agree with Supervisor Holmes. It's well past time that we brought this forward. Okay. And knowing that there is some interest in the public on this topic, is there any member of the public wishes to address the board prior to us taking action? All right. Seeing none, we had a motion. Holmes, second. Why again? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye opposed, none. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and move on to item number four. This is facility services uh, canceling the RFP that we had and uh, seeking direction from our board regarding the Placer County Fair. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of your board. Mark Rideout from the Department of Public Works and Facilities here today with an item on the Placer County Fairgrounds down in Roseville. Uh, with me in the audience today are several members of your Fairgrounds Revitalization Committee and folks from the Placer County Fair Association as well who may answer questions as we go on. Today we're asking your board to reject all proposals received through the uh, solicitation for a new operator. That was RFP number 10443. And then we also ask that you receive an update on the fairgrounds and uh, for your approval to let staff um, permit the fairgrounds to enter into contracts for 2016. Uh, we will return to your board in October for more discussion and potential modifications to the fairgrounds uh, contract to implement some of those recommendations. Um, today's presentation about the RFP follows your board's October 7th direction to have staff solicit for a new operator that can launch a comprehensive rebranding re campaign of the fairgrounds operation and address the site's physical constraints. Uh, the revitalization committee helped staff significantly prepare the RFP and it was released on May 4th. Uh, we closed it almost two months later, and the selection panel met in July to review the proposals. We had two responsive proposals, but the panel felt that neither addressed the needs of the fairgrounds and determined that they were unreasonable and did not meet the necessary requirements of the RFP. I'm here with John Manning of Procurement Services today to ask that your board cancel the RFP and reject all proposals to conclude that process and I'll go on to talk about a few other things that we have um, before us with the Fair Association, but I wanted to make that formal request of your board today. Um, I also want to update you on the operations and recap um, our arrangement to operate the site at this point, just so you have the background. The current association contract, there's a bit of confusion about how it operates. It's a year-to-year -year contract that's been rolling for several years. Um, there's a non-renewal provision that if your board were to take action before the 24th of October, that agreement would terminate at the end of this calendar year. There is a mandatory assignment provision still in place that if your board uh, selects a new operator for the Fair Association, Fairgrounds, the association would turn over the contracts and responsibilities to manage that site. Um, your board approved a loan agreement to help the Fair Association bridge that period, and as the memo notes, they have a $30,000 loan outstanding from the county. They're strategizing how to repay that by the end of the year as the contract requires. And through my attendance at their monthly meetings, I now understand that their revenues are falling below expectations. Um, in the last few days, I learned that they, make, they may make a request for ten dollars to $20,000 um, to cover them through the end of the year. They're having cash flow issues at this time. So we may come back in October with a modification to the loan agreement to help bridge that shortfall. Um, they're identifying their issues with maintenance and operations on the site. Um, we pl have plans to meet with them later this week to negotiate those things and also to look at sort of the strategy going forward. Um, when the RFP concluded and staff had completed their evaluation of the RFP um, proposals, we received an unsolicited proposal from a new operator who's been talking with the county about uh, their interest to operate the fairgrounds 
uh, the Speedway and produce an annual fair. And we haven't received anything concrete from that group, but we would ask your board's permission to continue talking with them and any other folks that might come forward so we can look at all the different options. When the RFP concluded in a manner that we didn't anticipate, um, we looked at all the different op opportunities for the site, and that included mothballing the site. Um, we looked at the different programs on the site to try and identify which ones were contributing the most revenue and were the most viable going forward. Um, as the memo describes, the way the utilities are laid out and the finances and, and the reporting of the Fair Association, it's difficult to determine which specific programs contribute the most revenue. And for example, the memo talks about the speedway and the utility challenges there. Um, regarding the other request in today's action, um, giving the Fair Association the ability to contract into next year, I've seen their uh, calendar. They've penciled in the calendar for next year. There are numerous uh, festivals, uh, community events that are interested in using the site. And there's also the question of the fair in 2016. Uh, there are kids that want to buy animals for the fair. So what we would ask today is that you let staff uh, send the Fair Association a letter, essentially, authorizing them to contract into 2016. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, the mandatory assignment provision still uh, is in effect. Um, what we're finding is, though, there needs to be some sort of a long-term solution for the fair. And I've talked with some folks about the year-to-year -year is difficult for them to receive um, favorable vendor contracts. And we recently received a proposal from the Fair Association <laughs> for a three-year term. Um, I now understand that that could be cancelable by either party on 90 to 120 days notice at any time through that period. And, and so what I want to do is, you know, sort of receive your affirmation that we can go forward and talk with them and come back in October with potentially a package that can look at, you know, a bit further horizon. Maybe some folks will come forward with other solutions. But um, at this point, I think there are people in the community that are planning to book events for next year and they'd like to know, you know, where they stand. Um, before I conclude, just real quickly, I want to thank the Fairgrounds Revitalization Committee for all their hard work assisting us. They've been meeting monthly since January. Um, there are several members in the audience today. Um, now that the RFP is concluded, they're having discussions about their mission and, and what their responsibilities are going forward. And we continue to talk about, you know, their monitoring and their assistance in providing staff advice on the fairgrounds. So with that, I'd like to ask your board um, to consider the recommendations I've made today. Okay. Board members have uh, comments or questions of staff at this time prior to us hearing from some members of the public. Uh, Supervisor Duran? Uh, I'd like to hear from the Revitalization Committee. Okay. So, All members right. to see what they... Uh, then we'll... Um, then I'll make my comments. Fair enough. Um, all right. Any members of the public want to address the board on this item prior to us taking whatever action we're going to take here? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hop right on up. Uh, once, fairgrounds. once you get up to the microphone, oh, I'm sorry. please identify yourself. And Greg Hegward, General Manager, Placer County Fair Association, and 800 All America City Boulevard, Roseville, California, 95678. Um, Mark is correct, except that yes, we did borrow thirty thousand dollars from the county, and we have uh, sent the county a check. I don't know if it's processed yet, oh. but we have paid that back. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's good clarification. Appreciate that. Other members uh, want to address the board prior to. Okay, let's uh, bring it on back and chat amongst ourselves here. Then, if nobody else wants to, uh, so Supervisor Graham, uh, kick us question. off here. I have a question for Mr. Hagar. Are you still going to be involved with the um, uh, with the fairgrounds? My commitment to the fairgrounds is to assist the association and the county through the, um, the disposition of the RFP, which I guess is now concluded, or the um, direction of the, the direction of the county wants the association to go into. So if the county decides to keep the association, I'm willing to stick around and, <coughs> excuse me, um, Help them through that process in staff training and also with board training and to assist them in a new manager, CEO. Um, it will be their, de uh, their decision, but somebody who's qualified to carry on after I leave. And I did, uh, I did read your letter. Um, I appreciate you reaching out. 
Um, what, one of my biggest concerns about about continuing on with uh, with the fair association is uh, there's been a breach of trust, you know, uh, and and we've been for the last, at least the last five years I've been here, we've been trying to get that trust back together, and moving forward, I want to make sure that we don't go back into where it was where complaints were not addressed, where uh, issues that came up were not addressed, um, and. Uh, you know the fair continues on its way uh, until we find a, an alternative that's that's uh, reasonable for everyone and takes into consideration the concerns of the folks that are there and the folks that are around uh, in the community. So that's that, that's my biggest concern about moving forward on a on a three year um, on a three year deal. But I understand the need to have some certainty in a term to allow folks to be able to plan events because most of these events have a tendency to be long range planned out um, annual type things. So I get that. Supervisor Wagon. Uh, Mark, I have a question, um, maybe for both of you, but could you do for me a little bit more the the analysis that, that you mentioned about sort of uh, compartmentalizing the revenue streams versus the cost of the different functions? Um, and right. what, what is there? Does that look very optimistic to you, and/or is it early in? Just some more information. Yeah, um, the fair association budget in one form is split up into about eight different programs, and they track costs and revenues on those. There's the speedway, the fair, the non-fair programs, which include RV rentals out there, and then there are some smaller ones that they track individually: the junior livestock auction, July Fourth, and those things. They also have a couple expense buckets for administration and maintenance, which aren't spread across those revenue programs. We call them revenue programs. And then additionally, the utility expense is buried in non-fair. So without really um, parsing that out, and I don't know the fair association with their limited staffing is, is able to do that at this time. And then my memo talks about the utilities for the speedway. Uh, the lights out there use a huge amount of electricity, and there's really no way at this time to identify that cost. So trying to determine which program generates the most is difficult um, at this point. So, so are we going to continue to develop that more, more thoroughly, that analysis? Um, yeah, we can work with the Fair Association. Again, I know Greg has kind of limited staffing, but that is a key piece to understand sort of their business model going forward. What well, sure seems like working together, it's, we certainly have resources to, to further that. And I'd, I'd, I'd be to, glad to, yeah. Great. Supervisor Montgomery? Yeah, two things. Um, in response to um, your comments about not being able to really track the utilities, it seems I'm not an electrician, but it seems like a fairly simple thing to put in, install a sub-panel with a meter to understand what those costs actually are. And so I would certainly suggest that we take a look at doing that because you're absolutely correct. Without understanding right. the costs associated with any given activity, we don't know if it's actually revenue generating or not. Um, but I just I wanted to make sure, Supervisor Durans, uh, it, it sounded to me like you wanted to hear from someone from the Fairground Revitalization Committee. Right. And I'm not sure we heard from anybody. Yeah. I, and I want to make sure that you're concern got addressed before we move on well uh, you, you know I think part of part of my concern is is a leap of faith in, in, in a lot of respects um, and uh, and and right now I'm just not uh, I'm not in that comfort zone um, and I just want to make sure that uh, moving forward I can get in that comfort zone and uh, you know and and I'll, I'll, I'm the type of person that doesn't you know I don't want to ever say never but if it's taken five years for folks to understand that there's a problem and start addressing it, that tells me that's a bigger that there's a bigger problem there. Um, but I'm, you know, and, and those of you that know me and have worked with me, if you, you know, if, if I can show that you're sincere about what you're doing, I'll bleed for you. But if you tell me something that's not true, we're finished. That's that's the way it is. So. And I'll just mention one of the thoughts we've had talking with the Fairgrounds Revitalization Committee is they're very interested now in getting into the depths of the finances and the operations and the marketing efforts. And one of my thoughts was that monthly the Fair Association could come and report to the FRC on the efforts that they'd made. And then annually when your board considers perhaps a future non-renewal question, 
the FRC could make a formal report on how they feel it's been going and what the vision is for the following year. So you can make an informed decision in the future. Right. And, and you know, and one of my biggest examples is, is I know that there are some business folks that are own businesses that are on the first association. And I've been to those businesses. You walk in, they're clean. When you need a question answered, you get the question answered. Uh, if you need some special help, you get special help. And if they ran the fair association like they run their business, we probably wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. said. Well, Supervisor Holmes. Uh, Greg, I just wanted to thank you for your leadership in uh, rounding up all the horses and cattle and for the That's fair. That's fair. The yeah. fair for uh, the, this last year. Herding cats. Am I to understand that you're going to be here through the next fair? In June of well, that's up to the board. Oh, okay. um, I, I'm, a, I'm on contract. I okay. originally came in in six months. Um, the board requested that I stay till the end of the year or whatever the county states. Okay. Um, if I start, if I go into next year, yeah. and this board decides to allow the association to carry on, I would definitely stay through the next fair. It's right. I wouldn't want to leave the county or the association hanging a few months before a fair okay. without that management. All right, good. Thank you. And again, thank you for your leadership on this. Thank you, John. Um, is there a, it, it might, the uh, Fairgrounds Revitalization Committee, is it still in effect then? Or if we take this action, it will be? Um, no, they uh, continue to meet monthly. Um, there are 11 members, uh, the three here today. Um, and we've had speakers from the Western Fairs Association, the CEO of Cal Expo, uh, Maura Rowe, uh, quite a number of folks kind of building their knowledge base about how successful fairs run. And now they're talking about moving into this next phase of really delving into the operations and offering advice um, to the Fair Association. So the Revitalization Committee isn't prepared to give us a recommendation at this time, is that correct? They hadn't come forward with a formal recommendation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Greg. So my thoughts on this, um, I think we have an opportunity. Uh, we're, we're being told by staff that uh, we're looking for possibly uh, a modification uh, to the agreement in October that will be brought back. Yes, the 20th. And today the only action that's being requested of us is to um, uh, reject the proposals that were received and cancel the RFP. 1044.3. The report that was done by RCH Group uh, that led to an awful lot of this and, and ultimately the, the, uh, the RFP um, had some fairly specific findings in it in terms of the, uh, the capital deficiencies as a result of deferred maintenance and all the rest. And I have no doubt, having spent uh, an awful lot of time at the fairgrounds, both during all four days of the fair this year and, um, and at, at various events since then, that what we're seeing in terms of the uh, declining revenue is directly tied to the deteriorating facilities. They're just not up to snuff for the kinds of events that folks might otherwise want to have there. You have um, ki kitchens that are partially functional, um, you have some, some fairly significant safety concerns with some of the restrooms and ADA related stuff and all the rest. And so we, we've kind of, our board has been playing, is it fish, is it foul, for quite some time with this conversation. And, and I think a couple of things are readily apparent. There's not a solution that we can just turn to and say, right. next year the fair is going to be over here and we're walking away from this side over here. That just doesn't exist anymore, or it never did. Um, and yet we have some opportunities, I think as Supervisor Graham pointed out, to have those conversations begin planning what is the future of the fair. But in order for us to have a viable ongoing operation during that interim, I'm convinced that it's going to require some investment by the county in our fairgrounds. We're gonna have to figure out, do we spend the money and, and bring the fairgrounds up to a standard that allows staff to, the, the contracted staff, I should say, to properly market the facility and hope to fill it over time with events that generate the revenue that we need to be sustainable. 
Um, I'd remind the board that, that you know, a big part of the sustainability issue that we're dealing with is the fact that uh, the state of California used to give us a decent chunk of dollars every year for, for running these fairs. And that shut off about four years ago now, Greg, I think, about three or four years ago. And that's right about the same time, as Supervisor Grant knows, that we started having a lot of these conversations about, wow, um, how's, how's this going to work? How are we going to make this thing work? So to Supervisor Grant's point about the, the ongoing viability of individuals' businesses, um, yeah, the, <laughs> a little different model, unfortunately, with the way that, that, that they're posed, uh, poised today. And so I would encourage our board, as we come back in October, after we take whatever action we're going to take today, that we look at an option that says, all right, we're willing to make a commitment. We want to make a three-year, a five-year commitment. Uh, what would that mean in terms of a capital expenditure plan? What would that mean in terms of uh, any kind of a payback we might hope to get from revenues generated by uh, the facility rentals and all the rest? Uh, and do we want to step into that business? Because the, the toe in the water thing really right now, I don't think it's working for anybody, and it's not a good long-term model. So that's what I would encourage our board to consider when it comes back in October, is, do, is this something we want to do? And if so, here are the amount of dollars that we're going to commit to it. So is that, Supervisor Wygant, your, your light lit up? Is that? Yeah, just uh, additionally, I'll map onto that. I think it did kind of crystallized for me. I think, you know, all of us on the board over all these years, um, there have been issues, of course, that, that have come up that have, you know, led to controversy and, and some specific groups that, that have gotten ornery. But I think there's always been this underlying commitment to try to make the fair work. Um, and so we've done some analysis and, and again want to thank the revitalization committee for, for their effort um, and there are notions for example like the city of Lincoln contemplating a relocation site and I know one of the developers um, has some uh, level of seriousness uh, behind that notion um, so, so I guess that's all by way of saying I would encourage um, staff and the revitalization committee, n not just in October, but, but over the next few months particularly, I, I, I want to see for sure a commitment to making the fair work for this next year uh, because it's impossible to, to not have a year lead time to, mm -hmm. for kids to buy animals, to, to be able to sell and other contracts to be made. Um, but, but I think if we could think of this more in terms of what, what is a one-year, five-year type of plan to make the fair viable, noting deferred maintenance issues, uh, and put a price tag on that, and or maybe a sliding price tag, uh, um, so, so the board could at least consider that, uh, because I think we're anxious to, to try to find a solution for sure, um, and we know that uh, it's a challenge. We know the climate has changed, and the environment has changed, and the industry is different. Um, but I, I think that kind of um, definition for the board would at least, it, it might help solidify some direction for all of us that, that might uh, result in an interim solution, not to mention a longer term solution. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Holmes, is something you want to add there? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make a motion that we reject all proposals received and cancel the Placer County Fairgrounds operator request for proposals and approve the uh, contract with the Placer County Fair Association through uh, December of 2016. Second. Okay, motion Holmes, second Montgomery, and staff has adequate direction in terms of what the board's looking for for some next steps. And, and I think that, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, those folks that did participate in the Fairgrounds Revitalization Committee. Um, I, and, and I think the work goes on. I, I think that there are opportunities uh, for our board to continue to receive um, the input that we're looking for from that group. And I know that, at least in conversation with my representative, the, uh, the Fair Association, I see Mr. Henry here, uh, president of the association, the Fair Association has been uh, extremely forthcoming and cooperative in terms of working with the committee and trying to come up with solutions. So I appreciate the association's efforts in that regard. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. We have reached 
the time for our first timed item. This is a health and human services item, one of the opportunities for us to recognize the good works that our folks do and, uh, and, and, and have it validated by others around the country in this regard. Mr. Brown, good morning. Good morning, Chair Euler, members of the board, Jeff Brown, your Health and Human Services Director. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to share some good news with you, some actual great news that the National Association of Counties has awarded our county five achievement awards for the year 2015. So they highlighted four, five of our programs, and I'll just briefly describe them. The first is the Crisis Resolution Center, which actually is a strong partnership with probation, Koinonia Family Services, and our children's system of care. And this serves at-risk youth and their families. Um, the, number, the second program to be highlighted is our Adult System of Care Mobile Crisis Team. And this team works very closely with local law enforcement to go out into the field and de-escalate any type of uh, mental health emergency that happens in our community. Um, number three is our Human Services Program, Help to Hire Subsidized Employment Program. And this program is a partnership with Economic Development. Very successful over the last year. Actually, over 90 individuals were able to uh, obtain full-time employment through this program. Um, the next program is also a human services program focused on technology. It's something we call telephonic signature, which uh, we have piloted throughout California. It allows us to actually take applications over the phone and have people essentially certify their application without the need to come in to our offices and sign formal paperwork. And then numbers, the last one, number five, is a partnership with human services, probation, and our sheriff's office which helps jail inmates sign up for health insurance. This is very, very important to put in place supports so to help ease in their transition when they leave the jail and come back in to become contributing members of our communities. So we have a number of staff that are present today. Um, I would just like to say I'd like to thank you for your support. I'd like to thank the CEO for his support. And I'd particularly like to highlight the work of our dedicated and very innovative staff in really bringing these programs to better serve the residents in our community. So if I could ask um, the staff to stand up today, I'd like to acknowledge staff from our uh, children's system of care. And then uh, you can stand and continue our adult system of care. And then human services. And then finally, our partners, uh, Koinonia Family Services and probation and also the Sheriff's Office. And last but not least, I'm not sure if they're here, economic development. So I'd just like to thank you for, for all of your efforts. You certainly do all of our residents here in Placer County proud. Great, thank you. So I'm going to follow the suggestion of Supervisor Montgomery, and that is since we have five different awards and five different supervisors that all five of us go out with Mr. Brown and his staff. And I believe we have our photographer who's going to be taking a picture of all of us with our awards. So we're going to go ahead and step on outside for a moment and get that done.
nice opportunity to recognize the folks in HHS for their good work. So let's uh, go ahead and take item five. We have 5A, which has six different components. I've been advised by council that we can take all as one action item since they are related items. And I will rely on the good work of staff to sh just tell us how they all interrelate. How's that? Sounds good. <laughs> so Chairman Euler, members of the board, good morning. I'm Rebecca Malad. I'm the Director of Administration for Health and Human Services. So I'm before you today to request approval of six agreements that represent the totality of a new process for HHS called intergovernmental transfers. Intergovernmental transfers, or IGT, is a process that's a funding strategy under the Social Security Act, whereby local governments, such as Placer County, can utilize state or local funds to increase federal matching dollars for Medicaid programs. California currently claims federal funds for use in the Medi-Cal system at a level less than the maximum allowable federal funding level. The difference between the maximum allowable federal funding level and the actual amount drawn down by the state is referred to as headroom. This headroom of unused federal reimbursement is available to be drawn down through an IGT by counties that are covered by Medi-Cal Man Medi Managed Care Health Plan. For many years, California counties covered by Medi-Cal Managed Care Health Plans have had the opportunity to secure federal matching funds for their local health expenditures on behalf of the Medi-Cal population. Placer County is one of 18 counties where two managed care health plans, California Health and Wellness and Anthem Blue Cross, contracted with the state to establish a provider network for Medi-Cal enrollees. Anthem and California Health and Wellness began providing managed health care services for low-income individuals and families eligible for Medi-Cal in Placer County on November 1, 2013. Placer County is therefore eligible to participate in our first IGD process for eight months in fiscal year 13-14. The mechanics for the drawdown of the headroom or unused federal reimbursement is somewhat complicated. Uh, Placer County has to transfer the required 50% match matching funds to Department of Health Care Services, who then uses those matching funds to draw down additional federal funding from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Once DHCS receives the federal funds, they then transfer the federal and previously provided matching funds to the Medi-Cal Managed Care Health Plan for Placer County less a 20% administrative fee. Uh, the Medi-Cal Managed Care Health Plan then makes the payment back to Placer County, less a 2% administrative fee. This drawdown process is reflected in the six agreements included in this board action. HHS requests approval and authorization for the HHS director to sign two MOU amendments, one for each health plan, to allow for participation and payment language for the IGT process between the health plans and Placer County, two agreements, one for each health plan, for the IGT process and required match payments between Department of Healthcare Services and Placer County, and two agreements, one for each health plan, for the 20% administration fee between Department of Healthcare Services and Placer County. So on a final note, there is no county general fund impact as a result of this action. HHS will use sales tax and vehicle license fee realignment funds totaling 1.6 million as matching funds to fulfill the non-federal funds matching requirement and then will receive approximately 2.8 million back from the health plans. This results in a net revenue increase of approximately $1.2 million for fiscal year 13-14. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any board members have any questions? Supervisor Duran. Yeah, I just want to make sure um, we don't have the agreements here. The agreements have been fully run through. Not that they need to be here. I've been here long enough to know that we do a good job there. Yeah. But I just want to make sure that uh, legal has gone through those and make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Absolutely. Right, thank you. Yes, several times. <laughs> Supervisor Wygamp. Just, uh, do you have any concern about the lag times with regards to the funds transferred 
or is there any commitment uh, by the federal government as to when they have to? Yes, yeah, so we have been told it should be about six weeks after we transfer the funds that we would get them back. Any member of the public want to address the board on this item prior to us taking action? Seeing none, we have the uh, six associated items in front of us. What's the pleasure of the board? Second. That was a motion to Rand, correct? Yes. A motion to Rand, second. Montgomery. Notice I never have to clarify yours. I don't know how that works. How does that work? Uh, second, Montgomery. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Thank you very much. I want to stick with our department items before we take up the budget. Let's go ahead and do the King Road widening project, as I anticipate this will be a fairly short one. And then Holly will go ahead and take uh, the personnel one as well, and then we'll get in the budget. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Alice Atherton. I'm with the Department of Public Works and Facilities, and I'm here for the King Road Safety Lane Widening Project. Um, so just a quick description. The purpose of the project is to enhance a narrow portion of King Road. It's 0.3 miles between Souter Lane and Brennan's Road. We'll install standard 12-foot lanes and 4-foot shoulders and some shoulder backing and it's a little bit of uh, culvert work there. Um, on May 19th, your board approved the plans and specifications for use in bidding and advertising. Um, DPW F enlisted the assistance of procurement services to receive review and then ultimately recommend the uh, approval of the contract before you. The bids were opened on August 17th and we received two bids. Uh, Western Engineering was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Um, let's see, the cost of the construction contract is $686,599.82 and it's in the fiscal year budget for 1516. The um, construction contract is included within the total budget cost of about $1.2 million. There is no county cost for the construction portion of this project as we received safety grants. Um, this is something we applied for and were awarded, so that's good to note. And um, so the action required today is that we're um, requesting approval of the award and the contract execution for this competitive bid number 10480, which is contract number 1183 for West, to Western, or with Western Engineering of Loomis, California, in the amount of $686,599 and authorize the Director of Public Works or his designee, design, designee, designee, sorry, <laughs> to execute contract change orders up to 10% of the contract amount. Um, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. All right. Board members have any questions? Uh, I'm no. assuming this, just, I'm sorry, Supervisor Grant. Just a comment. I just wanted to uh, recognize that we're keeping the money home. It's a company in Loomis, yeah. uh, which is a good thing. Yep. Um, this is uh, all within existing right of way. We didn't have any right of way acquisition issues associated with this. We did acquire a little bit. Oh, we did. Okay. For, just for utility relocation okay. of two PG&E poles on the north side. Okay. And the culvert work you mentioned, I'm assuming uh, that's probably that north side, fairly steep drop off on the north side. We're going to look at some stuff over there. The main culvert crosses underneath King Road, and then right. we'll do a little bit of the driveway work okay. um, as we push the driveway and the drainage ditch back. We'll replace right. the driveway. Great. Okay. Thank Other board members' questions? Supervisor Holmes? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, this is something that's going to be a safety improvement for the residents on King Road, and so I look forward to seeing that progress. And with that, I will make a motion to approve. Okay, we do have a motion. Holmes and a second. Montgomery, prior to the board taking action, any members of the public want to address the board on this item? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Walt Sher. I live in Loomis, California. And the last time this was before us, there was a presentation on the diversion plan on the routing of traffic while King Road was going to be closed and it was going to send traffic down Rock Springs Road. And I think we suggested that that be looked at because of the areas of Rock Spring Road that are blind turns with one lane of traffic wasn't going to work if you're going to divert traffic down there. 
creating a uh, safety lane might cause more accidents than you're resolving. So I was wondering if that, if that got resolved. Okay, thank you. Um, that is true. We, uh, this project was presented to the MAC and then that comment came up and um, we revised the uh, traffic detour plan to include only Horseshoe Bar Road. Yeah. And so that was, that was addressed. And in fact, I spoke with Western Engineering yesterday and they, we haven't gone into the discussion yet, but they're thinking about doing some temporary paving and bypassing the signal and keeping two lanes open during construction at all times. So that might even go away completely. So. Yeah, I, I appreciate the concern. I, you know, knowing traffic flows out there from Brennan's to Rock Springs and up to the Valencia Club and all the rest, I just don't see that as being that big of a deal in terms of this. I think the vast majority of folks are going to utilize Horseshoe Bar if they're looking to get into Loomis proper over to Del Oro or what have you. So, appreciate that. All right, we did a motion. Uh, Holmes and a second. Montgomery, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes, Holly, why don't you go ahead and jump up. We'll take our last uh, department head item. <clears throat> this is the realignment of the human resource functions. And you flying solo on this? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I'm sure our able counsel will jump in, as may be required. So, yeah, pull the mic. There you go. There you go. That's better. Yep, it's on. So, good morning, members of the board, morning. Um, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for hearing us today. This has been a long time coming. We've worked very hard with the commission. We've worked hard with. Uh, members of personnel staff, risk management staff, CEO staff, to bring this to a conclusion that we think will serve the county well for many, many years. Over the last 18 months, we've been working with these groups to evaluate human resource functions in Placer County for functions that are currently shared between the county executive office and the personnel department. We're looking to develop a model that optimizes and provides a more cohesive approach for delivering services. I want to note here right away that we so appreciate the work of the Commission and their diligence and serious commitment to serving the residents of Placer County, taking their role seriously, and really asking all the right questions. This is a change for them, it's a change for the county, but I think we've come to um, a, a good place in this and we'll be discussing that with you today. With your action today, we'd be moving forward with creation of a Department of Human Resources and creating the position of Director of Human Resources to lead that department. Obviously, we're in the business of service delivery, provide an array of services to public agencies, to the public, to seniors, to the homeless, deliver law enforcement services, provide elections, and our employees do that. They're our most valuable resource, and we recognize that. We're able to attract high caliber, dedicated employees, and we're committed to continuing to do that. Not only do our employees serve the community, but we serve our employees so that they can do their jobs well. And we want to strive, and we strive to be the best in the business in that way. And that's what this is about. It's about improving our organization and our delivery of services to the public, ultimately. Our focus of this effort has been blending structural requirements of the Civil Service Commission with the authorities and responsibilities that they have with industry best practices. The model that we're discussing today is a common model that occurs throughout the state of California with California counties, and we think that it, it's that way for a reason it best serves the interest of the public as well as the business needs of the organization. The current framework for service delivery was basically implemented with the enabling ordinance in 1961, revised in 62, um, and since that time civil rights laws, labor relations laws, family medical leave laws, and a whole expanded scope of laws and employee relations laws have come into play. It's offered employees more assurances that their employment is secure and based upon merit principles. It also represents new rules, policy, programs, expenses, legal parameters, and financial obligations for the county. 
Over the last 50 years, there have been many, many changes. So we're looking to increase the accountability and efficiency, the responsiveness to county business demands, as well as the changing needs of our workforce, because just being an employee here is more complex than it was 50 years ago. As you know, about 50% of our operating budget is spent on salary and wages. Our deferred liabilities are primarily comprised and driven by retirement and benefit costs. And we need to ensure that we protect the financial budget responsibilities of the county and align them with the fiduciary, let me say that again, fiduciary, <laughs> fiduciary responsibilities of the county executive officer. We need to bring those in closer alignment so that we can be more strategic in our business approach and how we manage labor costs. And I am going along and I'm looking, I'm thinking, the slides were automatically going. Ah. But since they are not, I'm going to just okay. catch you all up. <laughs> okay. So there we are. Um, so our, our um, objective here is to really develop into a key business partner um, with the Human Resources Department and the county executive office so we can be more strategic in how we manage benefit and labor costs. As part of this effort, our objective has been to maintain the merit-based civil service system and critical functions performed by the Civil Service Commission. We've worked with them, we have considered them key partners in this, and um, that has been kept in mind throughout this process. So the CEO convened a working group to guide the scope of work, to provide input into the process, and review and comment on findings and recommendations. The county used a couple of outside consultants with expertise in HR work and those that have done work throughout the state of California. It included internal evaluation and stakeholder input. They conducted individual interviews, focus groups, it included an evaluation and comparison with human resource functions and organizations in other similar jurisdictions. The steering committee included the county executive officer, the auditor controller, the personnel director, actually two different personnel directors, <laughs> county council, myself, and our deputy CEOs for risk management and budget and finance. Through this process, we consulted with members of the Civil Service Commission and actually presented to them on four separate occasions to the full body. As you know, the current administration is through two separate county departments, and it consists of multiple functions and responsibilities, each with its own strength and expertise that are focused on specific functions within the continuum of that system. What was clear is that the responsibilities overlapped and crossed departmental lines. Sometimes the goals and objectives were inconsistent in terms of what we were trying to achieve in the various, um, through the various programs. And um, sometimes there was conflicting guidance in terms of sensitive personnel matters, in terms of implementing programs and um, administrative approach. Um, the departments also, at times, I think it it's, it's gets closer all the time, but differ in terms of style and cultural perspective. This really pointed out the need to improve the clarity of roles and responsibilities and develop this more cohesive strategy for administering human resource programs. So ultimately, this work led to the recommendation from the steering committee to consolidate these functions into a single department with the Human Resources Director reporting to the County Executive Office. We think that would best reflect the high degree of coordination and cooperated, cooperation required to best serve our employees in the interests of the public and better align our goals and objectives. With the materiality of programs and financial man management outside the jurisdiction of the Commission, the steering committee agreed that the reporting of the HR director, director to the county executive officer was very important and consistent with the approach in most, if not all, other counties. 
In addition to those changes, the primary recommendation, which includes an, a really a list of initiatives, is the development of a strategic plan, which um, the steering committee and other work groups have done some work on at this point. But basically, the steering committee, as well as both of the consultants related to this, felt that a strategic plan was very important as this organization moved forward. A primary finding was that the increased use of automation was also very important, and embedded within that would be the um, creation or the development of an IT plan so that the use of automation could replace some of our existing manual processes. So the HR director, as currently envisioned, would be working to, with departments, stakeholders, and other groups to lead that strategic planning process and pull together this organizational model um, as, as it moved forward. The Human Resources Department would encompass a much larger role in the county than does the current personnel department or the re risk management function alone. It's envisioned they would take a more active role in assisting employees, managers, supervisors, both in the classified and unclassified service to navigate the human resource field. We think a consolidated department would have a greater ability to direct resources and connect all aspects of a HR. We'd be looking at a one-stop shop. No question as to who an employee might go to for information or questions for all county staff. With this, we think, too, that a single department head would have a better ability to balance employee needs with the business needs of the county. In this department, what is proposed is a director of human resources that would have a dual role. They'd be responsible for day-to-day -day departmental operations and administration, implementation of the strategic plan, as well as oversight of existing functions and staff support for those functions currently under the jurisdiction of the Civil Service Commission. In addition, <clears throat> the HR director would fulfill that function for the Civil Service Commission consistent with the enabling ordinance as was envisioned by the voters many years ago. So this representation is not perhaps what this ultimate department might look like. What it is really intended to show is what existing functions are currently housed within the personnel area, but how the reporting relationships ultimately might work. As you know, the Civil Service Commission is appointed by the Board of Supervisors. That would not change. The County of Ex Executive Officer is also appointed by the Board of Supervisors. And for those functions, such as grievances, disciplinary appeals, classification, and comp recommendations, those still would be under the purview of the Civil Service Commission. Additional programs that have been recommended in these initial consultant studies would include leave management, training and organizational development, workers' compensation, employee engagement, and safety. Should the Human Resources Director position be approved, the Human Resources Director would finalize the organizational structure as that strategic plan is being completed. So as I mentioned, we did spend a fair amount of time with your Civil Service Commission. And our series of discussions and negotiations regarding CSC interests centered around protecting the integrity of the civil service system and our employees. We had many meetings with the chair and vice chair, and we worked through some high-level policy issues, some de devilish details, I'll call them, um, to land on the approach before you today. Um, other concerns they had raised include, included ensuring adequate staffing and fiscal resources, direct access to the director, and an active role in the selection and evaluation of the, of the director. Um, first and foremost, in terms of maintaining the basic principles of the civil service system, the primary change that would really be before you today is the 
reporting relationship of the personnel director, and I'm going to say slash HR director, to the county executive officer as opposed to the Civil Service Commission. As most of you are aware, the current personnel director who provides support to the Civil Service Commission re reports to the Civil Service Commission and is appointed by the Civil Service Commission. Under this construct, the HR director would have a dual role, but would be appointed by the county executive officer, and the county, of county executive officer would be consulting with the Civil Service Commission in that. All other um, basic principles of the Civil Service Commission would remain intact. I want to talk a little bit about the independent nature of the Civil Service Commission. The construct of the Commission and the nature of the appointment and removal process, we believe, does protect the Civil Service Commission in maintaining their independence. The Civil Service Commission, as I noted, is appointed by the Board of Supervisors for a four-year appointment. They can only be removed for cause, and they would continue to set rules for the classified service. And, and I guess from a practical standpoint, the HR director, the county executive officer, and any other staff are really bound by the rules when addressing the classified service. So to the extent that the commission sets rules for the classified service, it's that relationship that really dictates how the Civil Service Commission um, maintains the classified service. So in terms of the overall authority of the commission, that does not change. Um, with respect to um, adequate staffing resources and the role in the selection and evaluation, I'll speak to an MOU that we arrived at with the commission in a minute. But I wanted to raise an issue that the, the commission was very pointed in um, asking us to make sure that your board was aware of. Commissioners raised questions regarding the implications of ballot initiatives in 1996 that sought to fundamentally change the role, the authority, and the functions of the Commission. These measures, A, B, C, and D, effectively dismantled the civil service system, requiring a vote of the people. Approval of these measures would have resulted in removal of both the jurisdiction and the independent role of the Civil Service Commission. Measure D was of specific concern, and that changed the reporting relationship of the personnel director from the Civil Service Commission to the county executive officer. And a correction to the staff report, one of these measures was approved, which pertained to scheduling of CSC meetings and the authority of the Civil Service Chair to schedule those meetings. The other ballot measures failed. So the question raised was the extent to which the interests of the voters were met and how these might apply or what implications there might be in this case. Both the attorney for the Civil Service Commission as well as our own counsel indicated that this does not require a vote of the people. It does not apply in this case that taken in the context of the measures this, this is not an issue that is one that could not be decided by the Board of Supervisors. So I want to be clear there, but I also wanted to be very clear that the Commission raised this as an issue. Jerry may want to speak a little more to that, but I, I'll kind of leave it there and we can, we can take questions. With respect to the um, issues of how they may interact or what the roles and responsibilities of the Commission might be with respect to the County Executive Officer. Um, we developed a memorandum of understanding that was drafted by the CSC's Council. Um, this memorandum of understanding would be entered into by the County Executive Officer and the um, Chair of the CSC and basically it outlines the process and roles and how the Commission would work with the County Executive Officer in the appointment and in the um, hiring performance review of that Commissioner. And, and to be honest, I don't think there's anything in there that wouldn't otherwise occur that certainly we would seek um, input and participation from the Commission on hiring a Director or 
um, potential removal of a director if that should be the case. So that is an MOU that the county executive officer supports and I believe the commission supports as well. In conclusion, we think that this overall system view within a single department would provide a good foundation for integrated service delivery and leveraging existing resources. We think the single point of contract, contact would improve public access in job search and onboarding efforts, current employees' access to benefit information, and current staff within personnel, risk management, the county executive office would be able to broaden their experience in the human resource field. We think there's some benefits to professional development, enhanced career opportunities, and we think we provide more consistent and strategic guidance to departments in applying policies related to labor management. So with this, the Commission supported finalizing the classification specification for an HR director and submitting it to your board for approval of the position. They supported approval of an ordinance creating the Director of Human Resources and supported commencing strategic planning e efforts and finalizing the departmental organizational structure. Before you today was obviously an overview of the proposed reorganization and the process that we went through. An ordinance to implement changes in the organizational structure in creating the office of the Director of Human Services and approval of the unclassified job specification for the Director of Human Services and setting the salary for the position. I'll t talk a little bit about the salary for the position. We're proposing a salary range of 142,626 to 173,306 annually. This is roughly equivalent to the HR director in El Dorado County, slightly below salary ranges, well actually somewhat below the salary ranges identified for Sonoma, Napa, and Solano, above Nevada County HR director. Um, one of the things that we found through this process is the, um, this field has become much more competitive over the last couple of years. There are, um, as, as we knew, a number of retirements occurring throughout the state, and we have very recent examples of HR director um, recruitments and hiring. So these are based on very recent um, comps for other counties. Um, the existing position, the, the vacancy of an existing position would be used to offset any cost increases. Um, we think that although we're not looking here to focus on cost savings, we think there will be some immediate cost savings, but the real benefit is over the long run is leveraging our existing resources, reducing duplication of effort and having a more strategic approach in aligning our and managing our labor and staff costs. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and um, take any questions. All right, we'll start with Supervisor Duran. Yeah, a um, couple of comments. Um, you know, when this first rolled out, um, like any change uh, in the county, I was very skeptical. Um, you know, irrespective of where you land politically, civil service, no civil service, the fact of the matter is, is that the people of Placer County, um, you know, wanted civil service commission. It's in the charter. If I thought for a second that this was an end around that in some way, I would not be um, uh, on board for, uh, for any change. But uh, after talking with um, staff, after talking with civil service, after looking at the charter, after doing some analysis of what other counties do, um, I came to my own conclusion that uh, that what staff was asking of us was not unreasonable. Now, <clears throat> there's a caveat to that. Not unreasonable for us and the fact that I'm sitting here in this board. What we need to guard against is down the road where someone may not be, someone who may be sitting in the position of CEO may not be as understanding as to what we were doing when we did this. And that little line, you had a box up there that had a a line that went from civil service down to CEO, um, that line didn't used to be there. Um, and my, my recommendation to, to the CEO was rather 
you know, maintain the same outline that you have now, but in order to add that a, a assurance to the Civil Service Commission's independence is to have someone other than the HR person directly report to civil service. Whether CEO takes that advice or not, um, that's up to them, but I'm sure uh, David knows exactly where I stand in maintaining the integrity of the Office of Civil Service. And again, it's not a political thing. Um, what it is is a philosophical thing related back to what the people of Placer County voted for, and that uh, this makes economic sense for our HR department uh, moving forward, uh, in large part because there are a lot of other jurisdictions uh, that do this. I mean, for, for lack of a better uh, uh, thought here, I think we're the last ones to move over to this model. Um, so because, and I'm not saying that because everybody else does it, we need to do it. Um, but uh, we just need to be very careful moving forward. Um, I think it'll serve us well. I've talked, uh, obviously, is there, I don't think there's anybody from the Civil Service Commission here today, so their comfort level is there. Um, you know, uh, I, I've talked to many people, my, my appointee, um, you know, they, they seem comfortable. And the fact that they took it up four separate occasions kind of tells you how deliberate they were in going through this and understanding what it actually meant and what uh, the effect would be. So I will be supporting this, um, but I will also be taking a look at how it's implemented and making sure that uh, there is no meddling on behalf of uh, a CEO's office. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Wigand. Uh First, just want to thank you, Holly, for all of your work and effort in this kind of exec's office, civil service commission personnel. Um, I think it affords us a huge opportunity to to realize a lot of efficiencies that just have been sort of cumbersome and outdated. Um, so I'm excited about all of that. And, uh, Supervisor Durant's comments were well taken also. I have one uh, quick, simple question, though. What, do you have any expectation as to the time frame by which the strategic plan will be complete? We're actually looking over the next two to three months because Great. a lot of the groundwork has actually been completed. Um, it really just became apparent that you know, you build a strategic plan, should we not have um, the leader in place mm -hmm. building it to help implement it? I think we're pretty aligned with how that might work, but certainly we're going to be, um, and the HR director would be including our existing staff, members of the Civil Service Commission, in um, wrapping that plan up. Great. Thanks. Supervisor Montgomery. Uh, thank you. Holly, and thanks to all staff who's worked on this and to the Civil Service Commission. Um, I really want to echo Supervisor Duran's comments. When this proposal first came to me, I said, you know, conceptually I'm on board, but I want to make sure that the Civil Service Commission is on board and that their role um, is very strongly protected. And I know that it took multiple meetings, not just Civil Service Commission meetings, but meetings behind the scenes with Civil Service Commissioners, County Staff, CEO um, Office, and um, I'm comfortable, as Supervisor Duran is, supporting this today, um, but as, as Supervisor Duran also indicated, I will be very watchful moving forward to make sure that the intent of, of the voters and the intent, I think, of us as a board to protect the Civil Service Commission role and its independence uh, remains. So um, really want to thank you. want to thank the Civil Service Commission. My appointee is here today. Um, but um, I'm going to be supporting this today as well. Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Holly, for your leadership on this. I know this has been a long time coming, and you've gone through a lot of work. I appreciate the time you spent with me, helping me understand it. I met with my appointee to the Civil Service Commission uh, Rick Ward, and uh, he had several questions, but in the end of the day, he was very comfortable with this change, and so I think it's uh, probably long overdue, and I think it's going to be for the benefit of the, our employees and the people of Placer County, so it has my support. All right. Uh, any members of the public wish to address the board on this item prior to us taking action? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the board? We have a motion, home, second, Duran. All in favor, please say aye. I oppose. None. Thank you very much. Thank you, <coughs> thank you very much, um, members of the board. And I, again, would like to thank the Civil Service Commission for their long hours, as well as the Director of Personnel for her um, long, challenging hours around some of these issues. So, right. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we will uh, take our final item, which is our 2015-16 final budget for adoption. <laughs> hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Andy Heath, Deputy County Executive Officer for Finance and Budget. Uh, what I'd like to bring to you today is uh, recommend the recommended final budget for fiscal year 15-16. Um, this is due to the state by October 2nd of each year as part of the uh, County Budget Act. Um, and it's, this final budget is intended to en encompass many of the things that the board has discussed in previous items uh, on the budget, including the challenges and choices and the proposed budget that was approved in June earlier this year. Some of the requested actions that will be, well, the requested actions that we'll be asking you to do today is just receive a report on the final budget and open the public hearing regarding the budget itself. Adopting a resolution for the operating portion of the budget, which is 16 funds, uh, just over $816.7 million. We'll be asking you to approve the final budgets for the proprietary funds, of which there are 20 of those for a little over $120 million. Approving items, these are new items on the master fixed asset list that have occurred since the proposed budget was approved on June 16th. Introduction of an ordinance amending, again, personnel allocations in the personnel allocation ordinance, and these are just a handful of positions that were added since the proposed budget and are being recommended as part of the final budget. We're also asking the board to authorize the county executive officer to allow uh, administrative non-substantive edits to unclassified job specifications for the new consolidated department of public works and facilities. And these are just looking at the job specifications for those unclassified positions and updating those unclassified positions consistent with the new job titles uh, that exist there related to the consolidation of the departments. And then finally, we'll be asking the board to adopt a resolution uh, for the final budgets for the special districts um, uh, in the county for just over $74.1 million. Outlined today, uh, we'll be going, going over some of the key considerations as part of the budget development process and what is going into the thought process as we put the budget together, the final budget. Uh, overview of the annual budget and multi-year budget framework. This is a very important part of our process that we go through throughout the year uh, to determine exactly where we're at and what we can recommend to your board consistent with what departments deliver in terms of services. We'll be looking specifically at the general fund and the public safety fund as we have in the past. And this year we spent, we'll be spending a little bit of time on the library fund and the fire control fund uh, because of some of the issues that have resonated uh, with the community and your board over the course of the last year. And then very briefly go over the capital and infrastructure funds, which are the capital projects fund and the road fund. Uh, just a real quick slide on the proprietary fund budgets, uh, again on the special district fund budgets, and then we'll have any questions and open the public hearing. Looking at the budget development process in total, um, some of the board policies that are delineated within the budget itself uh, that have been approved by your board and boards in the past uh, include really looking at the multi-year budget framework. What does the future hold for the county in terms of the more prominent operating funds, the general fund, the public safety fund? And now we're looking real closely at the library fund and the fire control fund as well. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, conservative approach to budgeting. Uh, as always, uh, both on the revenue side and on the expenditure side, the budget is built from a conservative standpoint to avoid any fluctuations in the economy that may ensue throughout the course of the year. Um, we're building in reduced reliance on one-time funding to support ongoing operations. Particularly this year, one of the things that we did was we're looking at, that, at the carryover fund balance that is used to balance the budget every year um, in all funds, uh, frankly and looking at reducing that so that it frees up that one-time source for your board's uh, discretion um, as recommended uh, by staff and approved by, by your board. Um, that carryover fund balance uh, has been, will be reduced this year by virtue of the salary savings that have been built into the budget, recognizing that the largest component of carryover fund balance in most funds is salary savings indeed. So about $7 million has been built into salary saving, which reduces that carryover fund balance that's anticipated by the end of the current fiscal year um, carrying over into next year. Um, we also address long-term unfunded obligations. Uh, your board uh, has approved changes uh, earlier this year um, as part of the uh, approach to funding the OPEP. So we continue to look at opportunities to do that. Um, and we're also looking at CalPERS now. So we'll be having a recommendation as part of the final budget to look at unfunded obligations. And then again, just making sure we provide the flexibility to adjust to those economic fluctuations by funding reserves. 
and we are recommending that a couple of reserves with the final budget uh, be, be funded as well. We're also looking at priority-based budgeting. We're continuing the path towards implementing ultimately a priority-based budget uh, at some point in time in the near future. You have seen as part of the proposed budget that's come to your board in the past uh, and the final budget last year, a program inventory where departments have delineated exactly those programs that they do offer uh, within their departments themselves. One thing you'll notice in the document this year when it's available in the next couple of weeks is we'll begin delineating what some of the costs for those programs are, what the gross cost is, what the dis non-discretionary revenue sources associated with those programs are, and then more importantly, what the net county cost is. What is it costing the county to deliver those programs? We've had several pilot departments that are, have gone through the process <coughs> and is with the final budget to begin delineating that, those cost informations with the, uh, with the budget itself. And then again, this budget, the final budget, builds upon the challenges and choices uh, workshop that was presented to your board on May 19th. Uh, some of the things that were discussed at that challenges and choices workshop include capital and deferred maintenance sustainability, environmental sustainability, uh, Placer County library system planning, the criminal justice master plan implementation, Placer County fire funding sustainability, and then succession and talent management. So this final budget does continue to uh, implement some of the things addressed at the challenges and choices workshop that perhaps may have been deferred from the proposed budget pending availability of any one-time funding uh, with the final budget. Um, and then, of course, builds upon the proposed budget that was adopted by your board on June 16th. Looking at the budget as a whole, uh, what this slide shows is that the fiscal year 2015-16 final budget uh, is recommended at $816.7 million. This is for all of the operating funds in the budget. And you can see this is an increase of about just under $19 million from the final budget last year, which was just over $797.8 million. Um, what's noteworthy on this slide is the 96% the, the of the budget exists in four main funds that, that make up the operating fund, and that is the general fund, the public safety fund, and the capital and infrastructure funds, capital projects, and, and the road fund. So we'll be spending a little, some time on that when we talk about that. Looking at the operating budget as a whole, this kind of breaks down where the bulk of the funds um, are, are appropriated, uh, recommended to be appropriated as part of the operating budget. You can see the general fund comprises about 53.6% of the operating budget at $437 million. Next in line is the public safety fund, uh, just over 20% of the budget, $163.9 million. And then you have your two capital funds, uh, the capital projects fund, $92 million, and the public ways and facilities fund, or the road fund, uh, just over $91 million. Put the fire protection fund and the county library fund in there as well. Uh, they are four million and 6.5 million respectively, just because we will be talking about those funds. But all those other small pieces of the pie are delineated in the other operating funds that are listed on the right-hand side of the slide there. So all those funds make up your operating budget. This is where the operating budget is split out in terms of the types of expenditures uh, that are, are within the budget itself. You can see that the majority of the budget is in salaries and benefits, which is just over $303 million of the budget, or 37%. The next majority of the budget exists in capital and construction. So this is those expenditures that are being budgeted for the capital projects fund and the road fund. Interestingly, if you extract the capital costs out of the budget, um, and then you took salaries and benefits as a, as a percentage of what remained, which is your core operating budget, it'd be about 48, 48 to 49 percent of the budget. So in the core operating budget, 48 to 49 percent of the budget is related specifically to salaries and benefits, which is why I wanted to provide you with how that is broken out uh, and what's going on with that into the future. Uh, the fiscal year 15-16 final budget, again, for salaries and benefits uh, for all operating funds is $303 million. Of that amount, about $172.5 million is related specifically to the salaries and wages. Uh, that is what we actually pay the employees in their hourly rate. Um, the next biggest cost is, is CalPERS. Wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about CalPERS because you can see CalPERS in the operating budget right now is about $44.7 million, and this is for all funds in the operating budget. CalPERS uh, has implemented numerous changes uh, over the last couple of years uh, that will continue to impact the amount that we pay for CalPERS costs uh, into the future. Over the next four years, you can anticipate additional increases in CalPERS costs of about 2 to $3 million per year over the next, uh, over the next four years, as you'll see in the, in the multi-year model. 
Um, this is because of some of the modification factors that CalPERS has implemented, some of the smoothing changes that CalPERS has, entis has built into their models, and then, of course, the lower investment returns um, that have been experienced. It should be noted that for fiscal year 14-15, the year just finished, CalPERS um, uh, investment returns was about 2.4%. So it's, it's lower than the discount rate of 7.5%. That being said, hopefully the way that they're doing the smoothing will mitigate the impacts of these lower investment returns on the fund itself. However, we, that remains to be seen especially considering one other area that CalPERS is looking at right now is changes to the discount rate by beginning to smooth a change of that change into the rates themselves, where we're looking at lowering that discount rate potentially to 7.25% from 7.5%. That will have a big impact uh, on the amount of the unfunded liability and ultimately the employer rates that are paid by the county in the future. So that two, two and a half million dollar number increase to CalPERS costs over the next four years does not really include that yet. So that remains to be seen, and it's on the horizon. Right now, the CalPERS unfunded liabilities uh, are for our miscellaneous plan uh, is about $322 million, and for the safety plan is about $111 million, which is one reason that uh, staff is bringing a proposal to you to begin addressing uh, buying down those long-term liabilities, even for CalPERS um, and the magnitude of them. The OPEB uh, is funded with other post-employment benefits, uh, health benefits provided to retirees. is currently funded at about 71 percent, uh, which is noteworthy. We're one of the top five counties in, of the 58 in the state of California that uh, is in terms of being able to fund our OPEB for the future. So that's a very good sign. Okay, now we'll go to the general fund. We've got a few slides on the general fund here. Um, the general fund budget uh, is being recommended at $437.4 million. You can see that that amount includes a carryover fund balance of $37.7 million. When we put the proposed budget together, uh, the proposed budget was put together predicated on a carryover fund balance of about $22.4 million. It came in at $37.7 million. What happened there? Essentially what happened is during fiscal year 14-15 at the very end, the county did receive a payment from the state of California for pre-2004 unpaid state mandate costs. Uh, that amount was $8 million. So over half of the $15 million increase in carryover fund balance is directly attributed to that one-time payment. That won't happen again. Uh, we'll get the interest portion this year, which is about $2 million, but uh, their state's fully paid up finally on all these uh, uh, mandate costs that remained that were unpaid for so long. $8 million is due to that. Um, also, we received some um, redevelopment property tax money that was anticipated, and this is the uh, former redevelopment money that would typically accrue to tax infant and go to the redevelopment agency that, due to the dissolution of redevelopment a couple of years ago, is now being recharacterized as, as property tax uh, coming, to the, coming to the general fund as discretionary revenue sources. So that was not budgeted, so you see that in there as well. And then there was some supplemental property taxes that were received um, and then some expenditure savings uh, that make up the balance of that $15 million increase to $37.7 million. Another thing I wanted to note is that over the course of the last few years, the county has needed $25 to $27 million to balance the budget uh, from, from the departments. This year it's only $22.4 million. And the reason for that is we are building in salary savings. So there's less of an expectation on what carryover fund balance needs to be to balance the budget when we're putting the proposed budget together, knowing that we are building in those salary savings uh, for the departments themselves. That's what you see there. Uh, the total budget increase, uh, when you look at the budget from final budget 1415 to 1516, is about 36.3 million. The bulk of that can be found in the 10.24% increase in assessed valuations. Uh, for the unincorporated area in the county, um, and that, that's pretty much your property tax. When we put the budget together, we anticipated about 3.5 to 3.75 percent increase, and uh, due to uh, significant uh, valuations of commercial properties uh, towards the end of the cycle, um, we ended up getting 10.24. So a significant increase in property tax is coming in this year. And you can see the, the increase of $36.3 million in the budget is rounded out by a little bit more of sales tax, a little bit more of redevelopment property um, tax trust funds. Um, Pre-2004 SB90 makes up a portion of that. Uh, that's that $8 million one-time payment. And then intergovernmental revenues associated with increases in HHS 
uh, service costs where we're getting reimbursed for a lot of those costs through federal and state sources. Looking at where the money is going, uh, when we recommended the, the proposed budget to your board that was approved on June 16th, uh, some of those recommendations included salary and benefit cost increases where we actually built in the cost of, uh, of negotiated increases over time and some of the CalPERS costs and medical expense costs. Contribution to public safety uh, was increased by $5.6 million. With proposed budget, this was consistent with the multi-year model framework uh, that accrues 46.83% of the discretionary revenue sources earned in the general fund to the public safety fund as a sustainable funding source um, as part of that model. Uh, HHS contractual services expansion, about $6.7 million, and then um, we did create two new internal service funds with the proposed budget for employee benefits and information technology uh, that basically moved $3.4 million net out of the general fund and into those internal service funds. Some of the things we're recommending with the final budget is uh, a, a reserves uh, for those two new ISFs, recognizing that we did not create those reserves when we put the budget together originally, uh, the proposed budget, uh, and that these will avoid any fluctuation in the costs that are charged to departments over time by letting them have that reserve. Ultimately, these reserves and these ISFs will flow to and through the charges that are charged to departments by keeping them stable and potentially lowering them in the future. Uh, so a $750,000 reserve for the IT internal service fund and a $400,000 reserve for the employee benefits fund. Contribution to open space, uh, we're recommending a million dollars go to, towards that. Uh, this was discussed um, in earnest at our uh, Challenges and Choices workshop in May, um, and to the extent the funding was available, uh, with the final budget, staff was going to be making the recommendation to add a million dollars to that reserve, uh, and that basically takes the the amount to, I believe, just over $3 million, uh, 3 to $4 million in that fund. Additional contribution to facilities of $4.3 million. Uh, this is made up of some potential costs uh, that may accrue to the HHS, to HHS in the facilities uh, for the adult system of care at Serby Hills and the children's system of care, uh, potential relocation costs related to a Nevada Street um, move there. We also have some miscellaneous projects built in there where projects, recognizing the different projects come out, come up throughout the year, this creates that, that funding source for those projects. Um, and then a video surveillance project of about 300000 is built into that additional contribution to facilities. With the final budget, we're recommending an additional million dollars uh, be provided towards street overlay and street maintenance. This is in addition to the million dollars that was approved by your board as part of the uh, proposed budget, so $2 million now. Um, and is also in addition to the standing contribution of $3.8 million that's built in um, every year. So $5.8 million towards from the general fund specifically for street and road activities. Additional HHS contractual services, this is just a true up of the amount that uh, HHS um, is required to provide their services, keeping in mind that the 80% of these on average is reimbursed by federal and state sources. And then another $3.2 million in rebudgets, technical adjustments, and miscellaneous things that, that happen uh, as part of the final budget. Increases to reserves and assigned fund balances, and this is the difference between what the uh, provisions to reserves was in final budget 14-15 to final budget 15-16 is about $9 million. But you'll note that we are increasing reserves by about $12.8 million uh, with the final budget in 15-16. And what is that made up of? What we're recommending uh, to your board uh, with the final budget in terms of uh, the, um, where the $12.8 million uh, is, is going is placement into the general and economic contingency reserve of $2 million. Uh, this maintains the, uh, the target, of, the minimum target of 5% as promulgated by budget and financial policy. It takes us over that 5% target, but we were right on the line of the 5%. So, Similar to what we did a couple of years ago with the final budget, we're recommending adding that so that we don't fall below that uh, at any point in time in the near future, that 5% threshold. We're also recommending $5.8 million be provided to the uh, OPEB and CalPERS long-term liability funding sustainability reserve. What does all this mean? Uh, you may recall with last year's final budget, we recommended your board approve a uh, the finance committee going back and looking at a different manner by which the OPEB might be funded in the future. We came back in November of last year uh, to your board with a new funding mechanism and allocated that $3.2 million that was set aside with the final budget last year 
into the OPEP fund directly. What we're recommending this year is that half of that $5.8 million be, again, funded into that OPEP, that new OPEP plan that we have, and that the other $2.9 million be looked at similarly, uh, the way we did last year for OPEP, uh, for the CalPERS plans this year, and going back to the Finance Committee um, over the next couple of months and having a conversation about how we may begin to address long-term liabilities associated with the miscellaneous and safety plans that are CalPERS, recognizing that there's over $400 million in unfunded liabilities. So we're recommending that we take that money back, um, talk to the Finance Committee, and come back to your board in the near future with a recommendation for that. Uh, we also have a placement into the HHS cost reserves, about $1.1 million. Um, and this is an amount of one-time funding that was received uh, related to 2011 realignment uh, from prior years. Uh, so we're putting that away. Uh, signed reserve for future loan repayment. This has to do with uh, certain sewer loans uh, that are, are outstanding right now. That it, uh, The principal payments on these loans are very difficult to make. Um, ultimately, these loans were made from the solid waste funds. However, um, the general fund does back those. And right now, the general fund is paying interest for those. Uh, public, uh, public Works and Facilities uh, and the CEO's office will be bringing back to your board in the new future a plan to write those loans down, uh, and this $2 million is part of that process uh, to write those down over time. So we're asking the board to set that aside for that purpose. Assigned reserve for infrastructure investment. This just under $1.5 million is related specifically to the amount of property tax that is now coming in uh, for the former redevelopment um, tax increment that otherwise would have accrued as part of the redevelopment process. What we're looking at to do with these funds is ultimately create a funding bank where these funds, similar to the way they were used previous to redevelopment dissolution, can be used for infrastructure and investment projects in the future, uh, setting these funds aside for that purpose. Uh, so we'll be looking, asking the board to consider that. And then finally, making up the $12.8 million, uh, we're asking the board to set aside uh, $440,000 as an advance, uh, as opposed to an expenditure, uh, to the IHSS program, uh, In-Home Support Services program, where recognizing the, the way that fund is funded, uh, it always has a negative cash balance because they spend the money and then the state reimburses it. And ultimately, the general fund has to pick up the interest costs associated with that. This will eliminate that need Ultimately, if anything ever changes with IHSS and the funding mechanism, this money would come back to the general fund. So it's just an advance to prevent that interest from going back and forth. This is your general fund reserve is being recommended. Uh, you can see the fiscal year 15-16 budget uh, pegs the general reserve at about $22 million, up from $20 million, consistent with the recommendation to add $2 million to that reserve. Uh, the red line represents the requirement. You can see we're, we were right up against that $20 million threshold with the $19.9 million. So just make, just make sure we have that buffer um, as we move forward. This is the general fund multi-year model. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of things in this multi-year model. Uh, the area in the red box is the current year's budget. Uh, you can see that there's about $12.8 million uh, that's being recommended for the reserves on the county bottom line in the yellow there right underneath the red box. Uh, if you go all the way to the top, uh, right above the red box, you can see that carryover fund balance of $37.7 million coming in, uh, recognizing there's a lot of one-time stuff that's built into the fiscal year 15-16 budget. As we look to out years, a few things are occurring. You'll notice that there's a decreased reliance on the amount of carryover fund balance needed as part of balancing the budget, beginning with $20 million in 20, uh, fiscal year 2016-17, going out to $17 million in 2019-20. This is consistent with staff's desire to really make the budget um, a, exactly what it should be and present the budget as such. Um, the, the $20 million carryover fund balance uh, is, is made up of different things. Uh, it's made up of the un, unexpended contingency, which is at $6 million, and it's made up of revenues that come in overestimate and expenditures, particularly salaries and benefits that come in under, under the budget amount. So that's what that's, what that's made up of. To the extent we can extract that out from the expenditure side um, and more closely um, budget revenues, lower, fund, lower carryover fund balance is needed from year to year to balance the budget. So you'll see that going through the model. Another thing you'll see is if you did the intricate analysis on what is actually in the heart of these numbers is we remove all one-time revenues and expenditures in the out years as well to come up with what the true operating budget is going to be over time. 
And you can see that with all of that being said, with the lower carry even fund balance um, and removal of the one times, the projection for next year is pretty much a balanced budget. Um, and then in the out years, there's very minimal deficit of 2.3, 3.5, and 6.2, which only represents one half of 1% to 1.4% of the budget as a whole, uh, which is, from a forecasting perspective, pretty good. So your budget at this point in time appears to be sustainable, at least in the near future. Looking at the public safety fund, uh, some of the things I wanted to point out here is the general fund contribution is consistent with the multi-year framework, uh, $85.1 million. This is as of the proposed budget. So we did not change the amount of the general fund contribution from the proposed to the final budget. Uh, you can see the public safety fund increases by about $5.4 million uh, year over year from final budget to final budget. Um, and that's made up of an operational increase of $7.8 million and a reduction in fund balance carryover of about $3.2 million. Um, cancellation of reserves uh, provides for redesignation of assigned reserves and minor budget balancing amount. So we are canceling some reserves uh, in the public safety fund to redesignate those to other reserves, which I'll show you in just a second. Total increase in the public safety fund budget, about $5.5 million. That's made up of, again, an increased contribution from the general fund of about $5.8 million. Public safety sales tax going up a little bit by 1.1, AB 109 funding, 400,000, and then that, that uh, reserve cancellation net decrease of $2.3 million. Some of the public safety fund recommendations, uh, as you might recall with the proposed budget, uh, there were certain recommendations um, that are on the left-hand side of the slide where we added money for salaries and benefits, um, consistent with the wage increases for uh, Measure F uh, and, and added staff. Uh, correction and detention increases, this added a net 104 beds to the, to the correction system in Placer County uh, where we're taking advantage of the full capacity of the South Placer facility by um, increasing or by opening the 180 beds down there and at the same token closing 76 bed, beds in Auburn throughout the course of the year. Uh, probation vehicles and the uh, Sacramento County of Office of, of Education Vendor Services contract, uh, 500000 there and then some uh, South Placer facility A87 costs, uh, knowing that they're in full operation of about $2.3 million. That's what was a proposed budget. With final budget, there are a number of rebudgets that the Public Safety Fund has, uh, particularly uh, those related to the PrEP Center, uh, a recidivism grant, uh, regional crime lab planning, and some other grants of about $1.8 million. Um, we're looking at the uh, South Placer uh, Recreation Yard and looking at um, redesigning that to have a, uh, a, a, a larger yard as opposed to a partition yard, from my understanding. Uh, booking improvements um, related to the booking area in the South Boston facility, uh, creating a, a more safe environment uh, for the ongoing operation there. Uh, centralization of the South Placer laundry operations, uh, $229,000, where all the laundry operations will be down at the South Boston facility, uh, ultimately saving, saving money in the long run. Uh, a new inmate tracking system uh, to track inmates uh, in the jail itself for $150,000 and other rebudgets. Uh, increases to reserves and assigned fund balance is about $711,000, and that is made up of this. So that's $711,000. Uh, we're recommending that uh, $511,000 uh, be placed into an AB 109 program growth reserve, uh, recognizing that in the future, any growth, a portion of the growth that the county will receive will be predicated on the ability to demonstrate um, that uh, the county is delivering on specific AB 109 programs. Uh, so this money will be set aside uh, specifically for those programs to demonstrate that purpose. Um, and then again, building up a vehicle a replacement reserve in the public safety fund as a whole of $200,000 consistent with the movement of the fleet program uh, that happened uh, earlier this year uh, into the public safety fund itself. This $711,000 placement in reserves is then offset by that $900,000 use of reserves. So you can see it's just kind of a recharacterization of, of where those reserves are going. All that being said, the Public Safety Fund does maintain a $15 million reserve, um, um, general reserve uh, that it has in the fund. Looking at the Public Safety Fund funding model, um, one thing to point out here is, again, we pegged the carryover fund balance, uh, about $4.5 million. Typically, it, it always comes in above this amount. However, uh, we recognize that we did build in salary savings for public safety fund activities as well. 
Uh, so you'll see that amount uh, just being static through the model. Um, this does assume uh, that in the out years, uh, consistent with the general fund multi-year model, that 46.83% of the discretionary revenue sources continue to accrue uh, to the public safety fund as part of, of the public safety fund model as well. So you can see that going from um, 85 million in 15, 16, all the way up to 91 million in 16, 17, recognizing the large property tax increase this year uh, that is expected to uh, roll into next year as well. When you look at the bottom line for the public safety fund, oh, the other thing that, uh, that is built into this model from an expenditure perspective is the, the ongoing operations associated with the, the staff uh, that was added with the proposed budget uh, at the South Plaster facility uh, to maintain those net 104 beds that are being added to the system. Uh, that staff for fiscal year 15-16, the current fiscal year, was budgeted for half of the year. So this model trues that up for the full year th uh, for 16-17 and the years beyond that. Looking at the public safety fund as a whole, uh, you can see that uh, the public safety fund on the bottom line uh, is sustainable into the near future, uh, given the uh, property tax increase. And we'll go to the library fund. Uh, library fund uh, is, uh, has a budget that is increasing by about $865,000 uh, from year to year. Uh, one thing to re that I wanted to um, call out for the library fund is that with the proposed budget, uh, there was uh, $400,000 in one-time general fund funding that was provided to the library fund, $200,000 for a sustainability reserve, and you'll see that as part of the five-year model that's on the next slide, and $200,000 for a, for a materials reserve. Materials, uh, materials uh, expenditures, increased materials expenditures. Materials expenditures and some of the things that we're recommending with the final budget um, go to uh, serve some of the recommendations addressed by the strategic plan, the library strategic plan that was approved by your board late last year. Uh, some of the things that we're recommending as part of the um, library final budget um, expenditures will, uh, in the reverse erosion component of the strategic plan, uh, summer reading program costs for those, 62000 uh, Furniture for the library, $72,000. A lot of the furniture is old and outdated um, and needs to be replaced, uh, 72000 there. Uh, in the build capacity uh, com component of the strategic plan, we're looking at transitioning staff into more of a permit staff role where there's more accountability on that staff uh, to deliver the services in the library um, and uh, more provide better branch oversight um, um, and then a little bit of overtime as well. And this is uh, removing or transitioning from that extra help model uh, into a permanent staff model. So about 206000 there. Specific to that $206,000 is about uh, 2.5 ongoing positions, where the request is being asked to defund the assistant library director position, which is currently vacant, and actually add two library services managers positions, um, which, uh, which will provide better oversight uh, toward to the branches, and then half of a uh, clerk position as well. And then in the modernized operations area, we're um, asking the board to consider placing a reserve of $258,000 for a new RFID automated materials handling, which is the um, electronic handling of checking and checking out books um, and just uh, takes us to the next level in terms of modernizing uh, library operations uh, into, the in, into the near future. With all of this being said, uh, the, this final budget recommendation, consistent with the proposed recommendation and consistent with the challenges and choices workshop that was presented to your board in May, does uh, maintain the closures that are addressed uh, with, with both, of those, both of those items. Um, of noteworthy importance is that there would be additional system-wide operational impacts uh, if the recommended closures do not materialize. So we would have to go back and really look at exactly what that would mean to this budget from a fiscal perspective, but more importantly from an operational perspective um, if, if the closures do not materialize. Uh, it is anticipated that uh, we will come back, the CEO's office will come back with the library um, and with the ad hoc committees uh, for both the Loomis and Meadow Vista libraries uh, at some point in time in the, at the end of the year, November, early December, uh, to make a presentation to the board um, um, with all of that uh, to discuss. Uh, this is the library multi-year model, um, the total library, and this considers a strategic plan phase-in. So it has some of the things that are built into the strategic plan, which has been approved by your board, um, and actually uh, begins to consider exactly what some of those impacts may be over time. Um, 
this assumes that there's a nominal growth in property tax and that continues through the model. Um, it takes out the one-time funding uh, that came from the general fund in fiscal year 15-16, which is $400,000. So that funding is not in the 2016-17 um, models or the years that follow that. So that's why you see those deficits predominantly on the bottom. Um, salaries and benefits, we continue to ramp up the, the staff uh, staffing uh, consistent with the strategic plan objective of, of building capacity by having those uh, permanent employees in lieu of extra help employees. And then the library materials budget, which your board approved $200,000 funded by the general fund this year, continues to uh, go through the model of the library fund as well, recognizing that they need to stay on pace with the library materials. That being said, when you remove that general fund funding, uh, you can see that in the near term, presuming that there is no estimated carryover fund balance in each of those years, and there likely will be, um, but, um, but we're working with the library to really look at their budget and make sure that they're, that they're spending their budget consistent with ramping up with the strategic plan. Um, with no carryover funding, with the removal of the general fund one-time funding, and with the implementation of some of the expenditures uh, outlined in the strategic plans, particularly staff, um, and the materials uh, beginning, we have an $855,000 deficit beginning in 2016-17. Ultimately, that will need to be addressed uh, as part of a fiscal sustainability plan uh, moving forward with the library in the future. So I just wanted to point that out. Fire control fund. Uh, this is another hot topic right now um, with, the, with, the, with the fire control fund. Uh, the final budget recommends an increase of about $736,000 from fiscal year 14-15 to 15-16. Uh, with the challenges and choices also, your board was presented with uh, the uh, fire sustainability, fire funding sustainability, knowing that CAL FIRE costs um, were going up significantly in fiscal year 15-16. As part of that, uh, we looked at potential service reductions in the, in, the, uh, in the fire fund and in the zones of benefit they were particularly financially unsustainable, uh, mainly the North Auburn Ofer Fire Zone of Benefit. We looked at closing the Ofer Station. Um, we looked at Station 77 Breast Truck uh, and the operations that it provides, four positions with the Sunset Station, uh, and then other vacant positions, Battalion Chief, a Fire Planner, uh, and a fifth firefighter position. We're all looked at uh, as considerations for a reduction of CAL FIRE costs moving forward. Ultimately, um, those recommendations were built into the proposed budget, and we wanted to wait until final budget, which is today, to make a determination on exactly what we were able to recommend to your board. Earlier today, uh, your board approved the fire consolidation study. That's going to provide a, 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 a very good mechanism for us to con uh, consider and look at uh, as we uh, recommend to back to your board exactly what fire funding looks like in the future, and more importantly, how fire service needs to be delivered, not delivered not only for the county, uh, but for the, count the county governed districts, but the county as a whole. And um, with that, uh, what we're able to recommend this year is that uh, we'd like to keep the North Auburn Ofer County Fire Service Area station open. Uh, we're recommending that that be open for the, the whole fiscal year. Um, that being said, they will use uh, $507,000 of their carryover fund balance that they had, and they will also be required to cancel $428,000 uh, in their reserves. Uh, that once those two things happen, uh, they will have remaining reserves of about $958,000. But staff feels that what this does is it, is it keeps those operations intact uh, throughout the year. Uh, in this fire season, it looks like just may go longer than, than originally anticipated. Um, and they were supposed to close um, after seven months or so, but uh, who knows how long fire season is going to be. Um, and uh, keeps, those, keeps that station intact. Uh, and then also, more importantly, gives us uh, time that we, that we need to complete the fire consolidation study to see if there's any noteworthy recommendations that ultimately impact how service is delivered out of this fire zone of benefit um, and the station and the funding. Uh, so we're recommending that we maintain existing service levels at the North Auburn Ofer Station uh, for the year pending the results of the fire consolidation study. Looking at the, the final budget for the fire control fund itself, uh, you can see that there was, uh, we're recommending placement of about $810,000 in reserves, an assigned reserve for equipment replacement, which is consistent with what we've done in the past uh, for uh, replacement of all the capital uh, and the apparatus at the uh, that are controlled by the county, uh, 400000 in that, 
and then a reserve for the fire consolidation study set aside of about four hundred and ten thousand dollars pending the outcome of the of the fire consolidation study it may have some recommendations that ultimately may require some funding in certain areas so we're recommending this funding be set aside for that purpose this is the fire control fund multi-year model uh, and you can see here that the bottom line uh, varies. We have an eight, about $811,000 carryover fund balance this year, $400,000 to the capital reserve, $400,000 to the fire sustainability reserve is being recommended. And then in the out years, it varies. And it varies uh, primarily due to the capital equipment line and the amount of money that is needed to replace that capital apparatus uh, throughout, throughout that system, throughout those years. Um, the of noteworthy importance also is that this fire control fund does receive an ongoing $1 million a year from the general fund as an augmentation into the fire control fund. Looking at some capital infrastructure funds very quickly, uh, you can see that the uh, public waste and facilities funds increases by about $15.5 million to a $91.5 million budget. About $15.5 million increase uh, for Ongoing bridge, road, and street maintenance projects, uh, Alpine Meadows Bridge Replacement, Yankee, Yankee Slough Bridge are a couple of those projects. Um, and then road maintenance and operations and overlay, surface treatments, as I mentioned before, uh, is going to be getting, is recommended to get $5.8 million from the general fund this year. Uh, capital projects fund, uh, the fund itself decreases by about $40 million when you compare final budget 1415 to that that we're recommending this year to about $92.3 million. Uh, that increase is, or decrease is due primarily uh, to some of the projects that have been ongoing for which a considerable amount of work has been completed, particularly the regional sewer projects um, and then the, the, uh, the startup of the Animal Services Center project itself. In the capital and infrastructure funds, I believe your board has received an updated uh, multi-year capital plan. Uh, Gretchen Nedved in our office worked very closely with uh, our partners in uh, uh, public works and facility services to update the uh, project information that is delineated in the multi-year capital plan, and then more importantly, better represent exactly what the funding sources are um, uh, that are available to your board or that are unencumbered right now and what the anticipated need for the future is uh, for, the, for the next five years. So um, hopefully you enjoy looking at that plan. Um, updated individual project summaries are in there, and again, a summary of the committed and uncommitted funding sources. Internal service and enterprise fund budgets. Uh, there are 14 internal service fund budgets, uh, totaling about $81.4 million, a change of about $24 million. That's significant. It's significant, however, there are two new internal service funds that make up the majority of that increase. We have the information technology budget, uh, which is about $17.4 million. It's moving out of the general fund uh, into, into its own internal service fund to better track exactly what those costs are, um, and more importantly, to assure consistency and equity of the charges for the services that information technology provides to the departments that it serves. Similarly, the employee benefits budget um, is uh, being moved, and it's about $3.7 million. And likewise, uh, this is a budget that used to be in the general fund that is now going to be in its own internal service fund to, again, uh, assure equitable distribution of charges related to employee benefits. Uh, enterprise funds, uh, there is one new enterprise fund for Kings, Kings Beach Center uh, that's being recommended, um, and that enterprise fund basically moves all of the costs from the former successor agency uh, related to Kings Beach Center uh, because those are now under the purview of the county and uh, need to be part of that internal service fund consistent with the monies that are raised through the leases and the rents that are charged uh, out in those areas. The increase of $17.4 million is primarily related to uh, Eastern Regional Landfill and a purchase of a building out there. So that's where uh, the majority of that increase is. It's about $9 million. And then there's some increases also in uh, Lassie County Transit and the um, TARP programs as well. Looking at the funded positions uh, with the final budget, uh, final budget uh, is recommending countywide allocations of about 2,838 positions, and that's up from final budget 2014-15, uh, 2,800 positions. Um, with the proposed budget, your board did approve 44 uh, additional positions. 
uh, that were primarily related to public safety operations, where it's recognized that opening the additional beds down at the South Plaza facilities was going to require additional correctional and sheriff's officers, sheriff's deputies. About 29 positions were added there. And then we also added five probation officers uh, due to the workload that was being experienced in the probation department as well. Then there was some movement of positions um, uh, between internal service funds and the general fund um, and very minor changes um, uh, at proposed budget. With the final budget, we're recommending uh, 13 additional positions. Most of these positions um, uh, have to do with workload requirements that have been identified since the development of the proposed budget. Uh, with Particularly with the library, we went over those positions and that's addressing that movement from extra help, uh, the TARP program, HHS. The HHS position is a, a homeless analyst, an analyst that will, staff services analyst that will focus specifically on the homeless issues um, uh, in the county um, and looking at that uh, moving forward. And then a couple of positions in the Treasurer Task Collector's Office related to, again, those workload requirements. Board governs special districts. Um, there are 169 special districts governed directly by your board. Um, North Auburn Over Fire is an example of one of those. $74.1 million budget there, and what I've noted on this slide is just uh, where the majority of the, that funding goes. Uh, obviously, the sewer maintenance districts, one, two, and three, comprise the, the bulk of that budget. Uh, and then you have fire districts, you have water, water shed, you have parks and rec district, park districts uh, that comprise uh, the balance of that budget. Okay, so that takes us to the next steps. Uh, with that, I'm done with my formal presentation. I'd be happy to address any questions that your board may have. Thank you, Andy. And uh, it was a lot of information, uh, well presented, and I appreciate it very much. Um, one of the things that I want to touch on relates specifically to Placer County Fire and you and I have discussed this, so that it should come as no surprise to you that I'm particularly concerned about uh, the fire planner position and that that is not funded in this budget. Um, I, I would actually like to invite our, our county fire warden up to talk a little bit about what that position is um, and the necessity for it, because quite frankly, I feel very strongly that even if we have to dip into our reserves, we should look at funding that position. So, Chief Morris, if you wouldn't mind coming forward. So, why don't, let's see if there are other questions or comments by board members prior to us having the chief step up, and then we'll dig deeper into that one. So, real quick, any other questions or comments by board members before the chief? All right, come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the, the fire planner... We've had two up until uh, June with the retirement of Fire Captain Brad Albertazzi, um, which on an attrition basis seemed like a good cut to make. My concern at that time was that we would have a demand versus capacity issue, and that's what we've faced. Uh, we're seeing complaints rolling into our existing fire planner, which is one, and we're essentially asking one person to do the job of two. And as development comes into the county, those demands on that uh, function will become even that, that much more greater and even the demands on two people um, should the board elect to bring that position back um, will still be quite strong. I'm concerned that fire department will be the bottleneck for development in the county um, and that's what we're seeing. The one person, uh, Captain uh, DiMaggio, he's unable to make it to appointments or when he does make appointments with developers as they're doing it, it's, it's too late. They can't proceed with a piece of their project until that review has come uh, or that on-site visit has happened. And so there's been multiple times where contractors are holding staff on, uh, awaiting this captain to show up, and he can't seem to manage that and get it. He's doing the best he can. He's working his tail off. But the, the uh, idea of doing uh, two people's jobs with one person, as you can imagine, is not, uh, not tenable. Um, I've talked to him at great length about, you know, can you pull this off? Knowing the answer, he can't pull it off. And, and as much as that pains me to say, that is not typically the CAL FIRE way or, uh, you know, we're, we're very ser service oriented and we want to do, be everything to everyone. 
but this has been a significant impact and I and I anticipated it would be that was in the recommendation of the county as well that these, this would be the offset and that's what we're seeing the beginnings of that if that continues over time it's only going to get worse for development and roughly what would it take to fund that second plan or position that would take uh, it's the basically we're using a fire captain classification right now uh, we could seek to look at a fire prevention specialist classification, which is a little a lower compensation rate and a different schedule model, but can do the same types of work. A fire captain is a Swiss Army knife of, of a position. They can do a variety of different things, and we use them as well into the investigation function, which is a critical component in the county as well. So uh, we would lose a little bit of that utility if we change the classification, but that could be a, a way to... Uh, realize some cost savings. I think what you're looking at with salary and benefits over the year, and this is just off the top of my head, it's going to be around $140,000 a year. Thank you. And, and you know, just to explain to my board, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the um, the impacts on economic developments and making sure that we do continue to move projects forward appropriately at the county. Um, and, you know, it's, it's strongly my belief that we are probably doing ourselves in the development community a, dis, um, um, a, a disfavor if we don't um, fill that position. And, um, you know, just as we've asked other special districts to use their own reserves um, to, to get through this time frame to get to a longer term model, um, I think it would behoove us as a board to do the same thing in, in this situation. And don't know if I've got two other members who are interested in doing that, but I really just very strongly wanted to make the argument for this and uh, put that in front of our board for discussion. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Chief Morris? No. All right. Thank you very much. No, uh, Supervisor Graham. You can stay up there, George. Um, the and, and and I agree essentially with what Jennifer's saying. I I think we're at a watershed moment here with the types of economic development that we have. And we've already got developers out there trying to tell people that we can't get of our, out of our own way um, with regards to getting things done. And we don't need that kind of press. What assurances do it, that can you give me that if we did decide to fund something like this, that you won't be coming to me a year from now asking for the same thing because the person that we, additional person we gave you couldn't get it done? That's a tough assurance to make without knowing what the development's going to be or how large that demand's going to be. If we could look at business the way that it was done prior, we didn't receive those complaints and we were keeping pace with that. Unless there was a huge amount of additional development, that would be the only time I would need to come forward because the, the workload had been managed before. And if it continues at that pace, we should be fine. Yeah, I would, I would support what, uh, what Jennifer's talking about because I think that that right now um, we've worked really hard to poise and position ourselves uh, in during this poor economy, um, economic development wise, to be on the cusp of, you know, of good things happening when the economy starts to turn around more um, and quicker. And I think we need to take advantage of that and uh, and stay on top of it. Supervisor Holmes, you have a question. We traditionally have two fire planners to begin with. And we had two fire planners during the downturn. So since we've got a lot of development going along, I think uh, it would be wise to go ahead and I would support Supervisor Montgomery's. So, Andy, perhaps the question is for you. Uh, we as a county have historically done a very good job of uh, achieving most of our cost recovery in terms of our permit and plan check. Is this not a function that gets covered under permit and plan check? When I come in to do a project, do I not pay a fee that's supposed to pay for this function? It could very well be looked at, at that. And we, I believe we can work with uh, Community Development Resource Agency to develop a model to look at future development and make sure that those costs, in, in some respect, would be recovered. Okay. Um, and and then the, the other question that I have along the lines of the request is, is uh, the do we what level of person do we need to pay for for this I mean are we talking about a, a, a permit and plan check function that is a for lack of better terms is a check the box kind of a thing or is it more art than science do you need to have somebody who's actually been through 
uh, any kind of a, a fire academy training, or is it simply adherence to state codes and federal codes uh, for a road design for turn radius for engines, for clearances, uh, for sprinklers and pressure in sprinklers? I, I, we, we as a county have historically uh, looked to partner with others for delivering a lot of our plan check related stuff and, and contract a lot of that out. Um, so is hiring another person for this purpose the, the best service model or is there another service model where uh, a, existing engineering firms might be used for this purpose? Well, I think what you're going to get, either, either direction that you go, you're going to get people that are trained to a certain track and that's the fire prevention track. The standard is to be trained uh, through the Office of the State Fire Marshal in California uh, through that track as a prevention officer, and that's what you're getting with the fire captain classification that has taken that track. There are very, there's various disciplines in the fire service. That's one of them. And what you're also getting is the benefit. When I'm talking about road radiuses and why that matters uh, to a developer, they can put it in the context of having driven a fire engine, having encountered those things. That's an important piece to have walked the walk and understand. And also to be able to re recognize what mitigations are, are reasonable too based on having that experience. Now from a firm you may get that experience and you may not, but I think the similar training track is going to be there. The educational base will be the same. Enforcement of the fire code and those sections that you've adopted locally. Um, relative to PRC 4290, great to have a Cal Fire person do that because that's our jurisdiction anyhow. So. Um, I'm not going to uh, make the argument one way or the other. You do get a utility out of that fire captain. And I did mention the different classification of the fire prevention specialist, and that's their whole job is to do that piece. And so we can explore that as well. And you would see a little bit of cost avoidance in that. Right. And I, did you have something you wanted to add along these lines? I just wanted to get a couple of clarifications. Chief uh, Morris and I have, have talked about this position, not at, at huge length, but one of, the, one of the clarifications I think I would be looking for is that position that we uh, tentatively cut with the beginning of this budget was a co-funded position, meaning that the county paid half and then Cal Fire paid half. So I'm just trying to figure out, one question is I'm trying to figure out if, if that's a proposal to go back to that paradigm or to change it to where uh, the county's paying all of it, or if we're going to go back and stay with the co-funded model. So I uh, I appreciate the question, and, and perhaps that illustrates where my concern is with us uh, uh, engaging this conversation at this level at this point, and that is um, while uh, nobody on this board wants to do anything to uh, hold up permit processing and all the rest, and in fact we've historically committed very good resources to making sure that projects get through a process as quickly as they can. Um, I, I would prefer to see this as a perhaps a supplemental item that comes back to our board once we've had the conversation, uh, answering questions as, as you just raised, talking with Michael Johnson and Cedron, figuring out how these fit together because you are talking about an area, a fairly small area of the county where we do have hopefully some economic development activities where you guys are responsible for. Um, and so really understanding what that man hour commitment would be and therefore what the county's fair share cost of that kind of a thing should be. Um, so while I'm supportive of the request, it for me it's more of a timing thing. I, I just don't think we our board has all the information in order to be able to answer these questions, but I'd certainly be more than happy to as soon as staff and the chief think they're ready to come back to the board with a full presentation for some supplemental funding to agendize that, uh, you know, when, when that's ready. Mr. Chairman, let me make a recommendation. Uh, we do have to come back to your board uh, sometime in October with um, a change in the CAL FIRE contract. Uh, and with that, the changes for the North Auburn Ophir zone of benefit uh, from a budget revision perspective, should your board approve the final budget as presented today. With that item, we could bring, potentially bring this information as well uh, for consideration by your board. Just one, a uh, couple more things real quick. I'm, I'm fairly certain that within the CEDRA budget, uh, talk with Tim Wagner about it, I believe there's 
about $40,000 as a supplemental that was designed uh, by Tim, essentially Mr. Wegner in the Cedra building, in the Cedra office, to essentially when there's times when uh, Mike DiMaggio, our current fire planner, when he's totally overwhelmed, uh, to bring in uh, contract help. I'm pretty sure, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's been done once already, uh, where we essentially brought back the gentleman who retired, uh, Brad Albertassi. Uh, the other thing I think that I was trying to get to your question, and this is old information because it was previous when we worked the numbers and looked at the analysis of, you know, how much in terms of revenues and uh, fees, et cetera, that are coming in for those two planners. I want to say the numbers, the outgoing was about 230 to 250, and then the incoming revenue from the from the fees that they're collecting was about 50 or 60 or so. Now, obviously, that's old information when, at a time when development is not, you know, ramping up as it is now. But uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. The 40K, which I think is in, pretty sure is in Cedar's budget, we'll have time to bring, you know, bring that back properly staffed for you uh, probably in the, in the next board meeting when we'll bring back the CAL FIRE budget. Okay. All right. Supervisor Montgomery, if, if we uh, kind of tack this on to that October item, does that address your concern? I, I think that does get to my concern, but I, I, I want to be clear that when that CAL FIRE contract comes to us in October, I want to see some resolution of this discussion as to how we fund that position. I think the position is critical. Um, and how we get to funding it is obviously a discussion that's going to be occurring moving forward. But I, I just think that, again, we do an incredible disservice to ourselves and, you know, economic development in the county if we don't fund that position somehow. So I'm happy not to make it part of today's budget adoption, but I have an expectation that it will come back um, in October with that CAL FIRE budget okay. or okay. contract. Okay, Supervisor Grant. And we have your assurances that in the interim, if someone, if some project does need help between now and the time you come back, that you'll be using those funds to put somebody on to get the work done. I, I will give you my personal assurance based on the fact that I've talked with Tim Wagner. Uh, there, was a, there was a problem within the system, within fire planners. He had, uh, I want to say, 40 k as a supplement in his budget. He went ahead and hired back, or the, the firm that he hired used Brad Albertazzi which was a retired CAL FIRE planner in the position up until the end of May or the end of June, I want to say. So I know that's I'm pretty sure that's been done once. Right. So. Thank you. Okay. Board members have any other questions prior to uh, us opening the public hearing? All right. Seeing none, uh, this is a public hearing in order to consider adoption of our final 15-16 budget. Any members of the public wishing to address the board uh, prior to us taking action? This is your opportunity to step forward. Please do identify yourself and try to keep your comments to the three minutes. Thank you. Do my best. <coughs> well, I'm Chair, I live in Loomis. I'm on the Loomis Library Ad Hoc Committee. And um, you haven't heard from me for the last month. Um, some think that's a blessing, but I was off in Spain um, helping with the Christian pilgrimage in the Caminos de Santiago. Um, but I'm back. Everyone was doing their homework while I was gone. And so we fully anticipate meeting our deadline of presenting a report to you at your December meeting. And with that said, um, we are rolling out extensive surveys of all of the educational facilities in Loomis this month. And we'll be including that in our results, which is really, I think, what's one of the timing issues that we couldn't move was we couldn't survey the schools until they were back in session. So we're doing that, and we will look forward to seeing you and working with Andy between now and then for our December presentation. Thanks. Any questions? Okay. Good morning. Susan Farrington, uh, the president of the Homeless Resource Council of the Sierras. I'm here today to respectfully request that in the general fund, you add a contingency fund um, to address homeless services in Placer County. Uh, we have been um, asked by you to work with the Department of Health and Human Services um, to establish four work groups to uh, discuss the recommendations of the Marbert Report. And this fund would be, oh, I would hope, 
uh, established to uh, allow you a mechanism to fund whatever recommendations we bring to you as a result of the work of those work groups that you would choose to fund. Uh, I'm uh, open to any questions you have for me. Uh, I appreciate the, the work that we're doing, and we will have some concrete recommendations for you. I hope by February to give you time to make your decisions before the uh, expiration of the conditional use permit at the existing uh, facility here in Auburn. Thank you for your time. I, I think I just have a question for Andy on that request. Are there um, internal dollars um, in the Health and Human Service budget? Or maybe it's Jeff Brown, who's disappeared. Uh, he was here. Tammy's here. Great. Um, you know, are there additional? Are there dollars within the budget currently that can fulfill that need? Supervisor Montgomery, Tammy Moss Chandler, Assistant Director uh, for Health and Human Services through the chair. Uh, there are not currently dollars set aside for the outcomes of the uh, studies that we're doing right now to continue um, working with the community around the MARBIT study. Uh, today, uh, if your board approves the recommendations today, we'll be adding uh, staff services analysis to help support that work that Andy mentioned earlier. We currently don't have any additional dollars set aside for the outcomes of the um, project that we're working on with the Homeless Resource Council of the Sierras, and we'll be coming back with your board, um, as Susan said, uh, in the hopes around February in that first quarter of the new calendar year with some recommendations from those groups. So we could potentially then in February, uh, if necessary, do a budget revision to uh, address that unmet need? Good look at that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Turn my own mic back on. All right, see no one rising. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring back for the board's consideration the 2015 final budget, including uh, adoption resolution, adopting the 2015-16 final budget, uh, as well as operating funds for a total of $816,703,432. Approve final budgets for county proprietary funds. Uh, approve the items listed on the county master fixed asset list for FY15-16, the introduction of an ordinance amending the personnel allocations of various departments to reflect position changes approved in the FY15-16 budget, and authorize the county executive officer or designee to make adjustments, non-substantive edits, the unclassified job classification specifications in the department's public works and facilities related to the merger, and as well adopt a resolution adopting the FY15-16 budgets for the various special districts governed by the Board of Supervisors. What's the pleasure? So moved. Okay. I think Holmes snuck in the motion, so I'm going to give Montgomery the second by default, and why again will just have to sit by and watch it all happen. I think. So <laughs> he's going to go fishing. So uh, with that, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Thank you all very much for your participation in this process of the year. Andy, thank you for your presentation. That concludes the regular agendized items of our board. We do have closed sessions. So at this time, County Council will go ahead and take us into closed session. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session to discuss uh, three items of existing litigation, one item of anticipated litigation, and for our conference with labor negotiators, all uh, listed on page four of the agenda. Thank <laughs> you.